Hey guys, it's Jeff here. In today's video, we are doing a full bedroom renovation, right from beginning to finish. And this kind of renovation costs about $7,500 if you hire a contractor. But today, we're gonna to show you how you can do it for $2,500 DIY. The first thing you need to know about these doors is there's two components to it. There's the bracket on the top, okay? And there's a screw here that adjusts the height of the door and the bracket has a wheel that sits in the track. So let me just show you this. You can put a drill in reverse, it's a Phillips screw. Go backwards to lower the door. Okay, and you go forward to raise the door. That's all you need to know. If your doors are grinding and not moving or they're twisted, you can adjust these two brackets to lift them up off the bottom track and get them working again. Now let's take a look at the bottom. Down here you have a plastic slide, okay? And underneath here, I'll just pop this up. This little pin right here sits inside the groove, okay? And it should have lots of freedom of movement, okay? And when we put them in and we're installing a door, we'll just set it in the right spot and then we'll just give it a shot with a screwdriver. And then when I'm up here adjusting the door, the pin on the bottom is secured in the track and it doesn't move because it has range of motion. So that's really the simplicity of the whole system. So if you want to remove them and put new ones in, you can, or you can remove them, tape them down and paint the trims and you have a brand new mirror door. If you're on a budget, this is a great way to do it. So what we do, we lift it all the way to the bottom Okay, there we go. And then I'm gonna go up just a touch. And here's why. Do the same thing over here. We'll go all the way to the bottom. There, and lift it just a touch. I'm gonna to take my screwdriver, and then I'm gonna pop the two pins out. Now the door swings freely from the track. And now what we do is we're gonna lift it forward and lift the wheel up out of the track. Because we brought the, the, the bracket all the way down, left lots of room, it pops off that easily, and then we can set it aside. All right, here we go. Okay. Ah, now the second door is the same as the first. Let's pull it forward. A couple of steps, and there we go. So the first thing I'm going to do now is remove the top track, because we are going to want to paint that to reuse it. It's amazing how many things as a society, we throw away that are perfectly good. I just need a paint job. And at a time where everybody's interested in saving a few bucks, learning how to do things yourself is the key to success. Okay, I think that's it for screws. There we go. So what we want to do is we want to take this away. We want to paint the front of this and maybe even the inside a little bit, right? Make it look all brand new and white. We'll set that aside. That's all reusable. Before I go any further though, I wanna get this track off the ground. Let's take a look at this. And I think we have an opportunity to learn something here. That was installed incorrectly. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel better. My plan is actually to come back and put 5 8 hardwood in this room. And so to reinstall the door, I need to at least have, you know, three quarter of a gap between the door and that trim, and I had it. And so now that I know that this was installed incorrectly, I have even more room. So that's the original carpet in this house, 1974. Pretty, nasty shag. All right, so this is all garbage. This is the new carpet and the new under pad. Okay, just to give you an idea. We're gonna get rid of all that, change all this out to hardwood. And once we have hardwood, we're kind of raising our expectations for the room. We wanna make this look like a house, right? So we're gonna bring the hardwood all the way through, lay our new track on there. And of course, everything here is gonna get painted. And you don't wanna open up a door with everything all looking brand new and modern to something like this. So we're gonna get rid of this shelf and this rod. We're gonna maintain the shelving over there, but my job, so I'm gonna build a tower up the middle here shoes and sweaters and that sort of stuff. And then we'll have one shelf coming across the top, a full length garment rod here. And over here, we're gonna have two rods, one high and one in the middle. That's for all your separates. That's so if a guy does end up living here, he's got somewhere to put his shirt and pants and he'll get this much space. As for the shelf and rod, let's get rid of the rod first, shall we? Yeah, that's screwed into drywall. Ah, 
That amazes me. Right? Like, let's face it, builders know that there's going to be a rod there. It's 12 inches off the corner. There should be framing there. That's fine. There isn't. We'll just... Just a cheap plastic rod anyway, right? That's why there's so many supports. Because this is just a cheap piece of tin with a plastic cap wrapped around it. That's the kind of junk you get in a bathroom in the shower in the 70s. They use the same junk here. Remember, building code requires a rod in the shelf. So the cheapest crap they can put in is what you're going to get. Uh, wait a second. I'm having a hard time getting at that screw. Now, if you're having a hard time making that connection and drilling properly, you just need to get a longer bit. That'll always work. Because it keeps the chuck away from all the metal. That's why I own that bit. People are asking me all the time, where do you get it from? Anywhere where they sell um, recyclable blades, right? In Canada, Home Hardware sells them. Uh, Rona sells them. Down in the States, I have no idea. I haven't gone shopping for them yet. I used to be able to get them at Home Depot. I don't just have this bit because it's cool. I have it because it's really practical in doing installations like this. That's one piece of wood, eh? Okay, there we go. Scratch one shelf. Or is it two shelves held together with a plastic trim? Oh my. That's quality. Here we go, folks. Particle board shelf and a plastic U channel. And yes, you can still buy that today if that's your fancy. We are going to upgrade from there. <laughs> Here's a little fancy fact. These brackets are screwed right into wood. They're even on an angle here, I can tell. That's a four foot panel. It looks like every 16 inch spacing, doesn't it? One, two, three. Yeah. That'd be pretty amazing if this house was actually framed 16 on center. Which would make some sense because along this side is actually carries the load. Maybe they did. That'd be awesome if I actually was in a trailer. Sorry, mobile home. That was 16 inch on center on the exterior wall. Two by four. Because I've heard horror stories about 24 inch center, two by three. If you got a mobile home, I'm curious how old your house is. And if you know what your construction style is, put it in the comments below and where you bought it. I'd love to know what kind of different construction they're selling out there. Because I get questions all the time from folks from different parts of the world with different scenarios. And the more information I have about what people can expect as far as their construction is concerned, the better I can help people in our members form. And if you haven't joined our membership yet, consider it. If you're going to do a major project, join the membership. Okay, it's just five bucks a month and you get access to our live shows and you can ask questions and you can send us pictures and then we can help respond to you about, you know, troubleshooting and that sort of thing. Uh, I think we're pretty much ready for paint in here now. Yeah, that is nasty, eh? Wow. Okay, we're just going to rip out the carpet. So that's today's project to finish clearing out the carpet and readjust this header so that I am ready to move forward with painting and then building the closet once I get the flooring in. The program here today is simple. We are in a double wide trailer. So I've got paneling and trims. And because I'm upgrading all this place to look like a house, all of my casing and jam extensions and all that stuff everywhere, it's all getting thrown out. I'm putting in brand new casings and baseboard. So that makes my process here pretty simple. The goal today is open this up, expose the framing, and hopefully we're gonna find a two by three underneath here as a plate that I can remove and replace with a one by three. And that'll buy me the extra inch that I need so that I've got enough room to put in my subfloor and reuse these doors. So, uh, without further ado, let's get busy. So I've got this jam extension right here. Okay, this is gonna go. It's about the same thickness as what I'm gonna put back, so I'm not gaining any space by removing this. All right, and this is what I'm looking for. Now, what we have to do is pry this paneling off and find out if we're in luck. Fingers crossed. Nope. <laughs> ah, 
It is already a one by three. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> oh boy, okay. I can see it. I don't know if anybody else in the world can. I want everybody at home to be able to see what I'm up to, but we're just gonna pull this down. There we go. Okay, okay. See, I thought I was gonna be all creative and use a one by three to solve this problem. They're already using a one by three, which means all I've got to do is cut the entire header to the new height that I want and then install a new one by three because I'm not going to be able to reuse all that. That's crazy. All right. So what I'm going to do is set a new mark. I just clean this up and then add a one by three wide enough to be my jam extension. Oh, OK, well, that's a little bit easier. On the back side, I'm going to take off this quarter inch vinyl. What you're going to find in life is every time you want to be budget conscious and be cheap and save some money, you're going to spend a lot of extra time to do it. And that is just no way to get around that. Here we go. Now, because I'm going to be finishing everything off with modern looking casing, I have a lot of extra mercy here. So I can cut back more material than I need to knowing it's going to be covered and I don't have to be exact here. So what we're going to do here is set the blade depth so it's not too ridiculous. There we go. Now I need my safety glasses now. I have no idea where my interior safety glasses are. I barely use them. So these are going to have to do. Now the secret here is because I know where I'm cutting right off the edge of this mark here. So this here is when you're cutting 45, that's the notch. That's where you see the blade. And this is the regular one. This groove right here, that's your cutting line. Okay, fair piece of wood here. I'm gonna go a little bit higher than I need to, again, because I'm gonna finish wide with my one by four. If you're staring at your blade, everything that's bouncing around in here is coming right at your face. So protect yourself, stay away from the blade and stare here. And that's where you gotta look. Look where you're going, not where you've been, okay? That's the safest way to use a tool. So what I gotta do now is peel off the trims, pull all the extra nails off, prep this area, reinstate the trim, reinstate this to the, the wood, and then go shopping for a new one by four. Now, once I put the new one by four on, I'll have it come out to the, the face of this and cover on the inside so that my casing will go on it and I'll have gained that extra half an inch that I'm losing by putting down subfloor. We're back in business. So the key here is I'm adding half inch subfloor. I removed the extra half inch MDF, MDF paper wrap and by reinstating a one by three that's actually one by four and making it wide enough to cap it all, I don't need the second piece with all the trims. Next step is to pull this carpet. This looks like they used uh, spray glue just to tack down the underpad. It doesn't hardly bond anything to anything, but it kept it in place while they were doing the install. Okay. It looks like when they changed the carpet, they changed this tack strip, put a new piece in, but left all the old ones there. Hopefully, they come off without too much of a fight. <laughs> What I'm doing is I'm just using my claw flat on the ground and coming straight to the head of the nail where I know it's attached. And it's just creating a wedge. It does most of the work for you. Just getting there. And then they come out in one piece. That's so much easier to manage. Unfortunately, I can't do that on around the edge. Oh, wow. Let me tell you something. Oh. This stuff from the 1970s is a lot stronger 
than that recent one. I'll tell you that right now. Look at that. It's not even taking the nails out. Oh, great. I'm gonna have nothing but nails breaking through. These tack strips are more like a luon, like a, instead of a piece of wood, they're like a piece of plywood. You see, the nails are all breaking off instead of coming out. Look at this. Well, there's two ways to deal with nails. One is to take them out. One is to drive them in. <laughs> well, once I get all of this removed and all the trim's gone, um, we'll put in that new one by three. Then we're gonna prime this place up. All right, guys, so now we got the hole resized for the closet and we're gonna be priming soon. But before we get into all that, let's just take a minute and fix up these doors. So I want you to have faith that you can restore these things. This is the 3M hand masker, all right? We just stretch it out. We're gonna just tape and drape over my existing. I tape along the perimeter just to set up a really nice edge for myself. You wanna get a really nice sharp knife here. This comes as a six foot plastic cover. And the reason we wanna go dramatic like this is just because when you're using an airless sprayer, it has a pretty defined line and you can use a spray shield or something, but we're using a spray can and it has a really broad spray pattern. It's oil based, it doesn't dry in the air on the way to the product. So we gotta make sure that we get this where we want it and that we tape it off. This will ensure that we don't have to clean the glass after the fact. And when we get down to the bottom, if we're a little short on the plastic, we're just gonna run a couple of runs of tape here to cover the glass. That is masking quick and easy. Now, just as a side note, I'll tell you something right now. If you have, it's totally unrelated to this project, but if you have a wooden window and you wanted to paint the wood and you got the wooden frames on the inside, there is a product on the market at the professional paint stores. And what it is, it's a product that you apply to the whole window, okay? The wood and the glass. And this particular product, you apply to everything. And what it does, it seals and primes the wood and it creates a film on the glass. So then you can go along and spray all of your wood only. Take a knife and you cut the inside of the paint and peel that film off that comes with the paint. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a video on that because it's a miracle worker. You're stuck dealing with old wooden windows you're trying to restore. But I just saw that in the store the other day. It reminded me, man, it's been a while since I used it. But somebody out there is gonna appreciate the tip. Um, if you're not sure where to find it, you can definitely pick it up at Sherwin-Williams. Pop by, ask the manager and say, hey, where's that spray-on primer for wood that can be peeled off the glass after the fact? Now, I have a little bit of tape on my metal. Let's get that out of my way. Here we go. High performance enamel. Shake it. Ah, really good. Don't worry about the wall behind me. We're gonna be doing all kinds of wonderful things to it. Now, nice and quick. Just get a bit of a base coat on there. Okay, until this paint starts to come out. There we go, now we'll slow down. Get a nice, get a nice coat from a couple of different angles. The secret to this paint is don't press the button until your can is moving, all right? And don't put too much product on there that it starts to drip. This actually does dry up in about 15 minutes. So you have the luxury of coming back for another coat if you find the color from metal behind is still poking through. There we go. So, a few bucks in tape and plastic not even half a can of spray paint. Here's a $20 project. That'll save you almost $100 a door. All right, let's let that sit for a few minutes and then we'll hit it again. We'll do the other door. Then we're gonna put them away in storage in another part of the house because the next step in this room is actually to put the subflooring down and then we can get this place primed. So I'm gonna be installing 5 8 plywood on this floor. We gotta change out the trims and the baseboard, put in a new flooring. But I wanted to show you some of these tricks with working in the manufactured homes. The challenges we're gonna run into seem to be new every day. And that's fine, because if you have to deal with challenges, then you can overcome them. And every time you overcome a challenge, you become more and more ferocious in your building skills. And it just 
fuels your toolbox to handle problems in the future. From the joint to the joint of this building material, it is four feet. Okay, great, but from the chalk line to the chalk line, the other joists are not on center. They're kind of close-ish. All right, so here's my challenge. If I take four by eight sheets of plywood and I want to go contrary to the joist because that's the strongest direction and the joists are running this way. So we're going to go this way. <laughs> I don't want to turn this into uh, a work of art where I've got to be measuring off from the joint to the wall and make everything perfect because honestly, I'm just putting a floating floor on. It's not going to be tiled or anything serious. So what I'm going to do, since I only have the four foot joints that I can rely on, I'm going to take my subfloor and I'm going to just uh, drop it on the four foot line. Okay? And here's why. If this is a floor and it should be flattened is, as I get to the outside, you can see that gap. Right? I don't know if that camera angle allows you to see that gap, but my finger goes underneath that. So 10 inches, and I got pretty thick fingers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just square off. I'm gonna cut pieces to fill. I'm gonna keep my life simple. And I'm just gonna install this over top of the existing. In other areas, we've got weak spots, we've got holes, we've got inconsistencies, and trying to remove all the subfloor makes no sense. So we're gonna keep our life simple. The uh, screws we're gonna be using here, guys, are two inch construction screws. That's right. On this channel, you've heard me mention all the time, um, uh, subfloor screws. What the heck is a subfloor screw down here in the US? Remember, this home is down here in Florida. We're on a work visa, so things are changing. We're actually using materials that everybody in the South is using. We're gonna get rid of a lot of confusion on this channel and create a lot more. <laughs> I love it. I go to the store and I'm like, guys, I need screws. They've got drywall. They've got outdoor, they've got deck screws, and they've got construction screws. That's it. You don't have subfloor screws here. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, I understand they're basically a construction screw, that's fine. Here's the thing. This is a two inch screw. It's got a smooth shaft on the top of the head, and it fits a T25 bit, which comes in the bucket if you need one. And here is how we're gonna do this, okay? I'm gonna throw a screw in the corner and attach it to the joist. And I'm gonna bury it till the head is underneath the wood. Just, okay? This thickness is thick enough to go through the subfloor, through the next subfloor. I get about three quarters into the joist, which is plenty strong, and it gives me a bit of a guarantee because if they're running electrical or plumbing, they're not gonna put it right at the top of the joist. So, wherever this line is, I'm gonna drop a screw and I'm gonna go just below the surface and stop. That way I can sleep at night knowing I'm not gonna cause any more damage, increase the scope of work. I don't have to worry about being 16 on center. I have to worry about finding the joist. This gets rid of all my squeaks, all my concerns, gives me a solid structure that I can stand on because this crap material that's wedged in between here and the joist, it's gonna transfer the load just fine. It's stuck there, it's not moving, okay? So even if it's soft in between the two, I've got a subfloor now that is standard thickness in every new home construction that is not slab on grade. So 16 on center, give or take, with a 5 8 plywood, that's all we need to do. I'm not going to try to re-engineer the house. I'm not going to try to say, hey, <laughs> this is a great time for overkill, because remember, we're working on a budget here. And if I go overkill in everything I do, I'm gonna go over killing my budget. So, every 16 inches on the edges, every 16 on the joists, and we're gonna drop this sucker in in no time. Of course, that means I have to undercut all the doors, and that's fine. I'd rather undercut all the doors than spend an entire two or three days ripping out all this subfloor and then reinstating a brand new one. That just doesn't make any sense. That's a lot of garbage. That's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra time. And to be honest with you, the house value does not sustain putting that kind of time and energy and money into it. So we are keeping this simple. 
And once I finish off the rest of this room, <laughs> I'm gonna have a solid surface that I can work on, and then we're gonna get out all the big guns and start working on refinishing. Just to get this clear, this is a glossy wood surface, all right? This is old wood paneling. So, in theory, if you have the right primer, you can paint this. In past times, I've always recommended going odorless zinger, which is an oil-based product. Runs about 85 bucks a gallon. So this time around, I went shopping, came by Sherwin-Williams, and they have a wood product here called ProBlock, Prep Right. I mean, you gotta love these words. Not marketing geniuses, but it's hard to be confused, right? <laughs> so. We're gonna throw this in the sprayer and we're gonna actually spray the walls down and put on a layer of, um, what do we call it, transition primer, okay? That way we can go from wood to paint and after this paint is cured, it's not gonna be able to scratch off with your fingernail. That's the benefit. Lots of primers don't bond well enough on a glossy surface to do that. That's why we chose this, specifically formulated. Technology is a wonderful thing. Really what we wanna do is just prep for the sprayer right now. So we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to vacuum. Okay, we can't have dust around because of the nature of a sprayer, any dust that's around, the sprayer is just gonna blow it up in the atmosphere. It's gonna land on your walls. You're gonna have to sand it, sand it. When you sand it, you'll expose little pieces of glossy. You're gonna be running into all kinds of trouble, right? So preparation is part of the job of painting. It's actually usually about the same or more work than actually painting. In this case, just gotta take off all the cover plates. And the reason for that is I don't wanna have a scenario where I'm finished the entire job and I walk into a room and I got a cover plate that's not perfectly square and I go to move it and I expose all the old wood paneling. You're back to square one. Remember, we're gonna frame this out and put casing on. These lines have to be perfectly parallel. It's a lot easier at the end of the day to get rid of the old yellow plates and then put on brand new plates. Now here's a trick for you. We're down in Florida, which means as a homeowner, I'm not allowed to mess around with the switches and the plugs. So. If that's the case and you're stuck with the old yellow ones, shot of kills, original. This is an oil-based primer. And then give that five minutes, flick the light the other direction, shoot the bottom side. And then when you're done, pull out a little of this high performance enamel white spray paint, okay? And make that switch brand new. Then when you put on your new white cover plate and your new white plugs, all of a sudden you got brand new electrical. <laughs> And of course, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna cover up this. I'm on a budget. I don't know if I'm gonna keep it yet, but in the spirit of saving me a whole lot of time, just disconnect that, take off the knob, we'll take off the lens, and we'll have access to take off the blades. In order to get rid of these fan blades, you got two options. You can actually come on top and undo the three screws. That's real frustrating. This is two screws. They're just Phillips and they're machine thread. And you can just move these around to where it's convenient. If your fan blades look like this, you can take them off, wash them, and re reinstall them just as easily. Don't try to wash them in place. That just makes a hell of a mess. All right, let's well, stay tuned. We're gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna try painting this bad boy. I'm too short. <laughs> I need an actual ladder. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that's better. There we go. Okay, good to go. There we are. And then we'll just keep on taping the same direction that I was wrapping the plastic. That'll bond all that together. Close up a couple of gaps. Good to go. Well, it's ugly, but effective, huh? So now let's get rid of everything out of the room. We'll finish taking off the rest of the plates and we'll get the primer going. Woohoo! Here's our new product. And here's the old product. Now we just finished doing a series on how to paint the outside of your house. And this is a Sherwin-Williams exterior paint. It's designed to be used on siding in certain climates. Okay, so you gotta watch that video to find out if it's right for you. Yes, my pump is full of the other paint. Yes, this line is full of the other paint. Yes, they're both acrylic latex with different additives to have different features and benefits. I'm not concerned if a little bit of that paint mixes with my primer. It's gonna be like a 95-5 mix. So, instead of going through the process of washing it all out and rinsing it all out, I'm just gonna switch over. <laughs> because I know 
that the foundation for most of this paint is exactly the same. It's kind of like getting a couple of carrots in your peas, you know? They're both vegetables and it's not going to kill you. I guess unless you're allergic to carrots. <laughs> All right. Now, we got power. We got it on. We're just going to make sure that this is full of paint and flick the switch. There we go. Now we know it's full. I guess we were painting outside until we ran out of paint, so everything kind of got a little empty. Basically, we have two lines here. One pulls it in and one feeds it back, okay? So if you're switching over, you take this off, you put it in a pail, you wash it with water, and then you go put it in the pail. You leave it in the pail with the water when you put a new paint in, then you run the paint through until the paint's coming in the pail. It's a lot of time and energy, and then you waste material. So this is just more efficient. I'm a big fan. This is a, uh, a half horsepower. Not a 5H, this is the X5, not the X7, we've seen in other videos. So it's great for homeowners, great for interior projects. I think it was only three, maybe $400, it's not bad. What I'm gonna do right now is just check to see if my spray's coming out nice, okay? And then uh, I'm gonna adjust the tip if I need to clean it. Yeah, here we're gonna clean the tip now, watch this. She's a little dried out. Now you see how I've got this finger line effect going on with that paint right here? We're going to adjust our pressure, see if we can get rid of that. That's much more consistent. There we go. Well, I'm liking that. Eh, now it's time to get to work. We're going to start up here with our ceiling line. That is a plastic trim and it needs to be primed. And even though it's not officially wood, this is going to bond to it just fine. See that? Primed. Okay, I'm also going to do the ceiling because I can prime and get a ceiling finish all in the same coat. <laughs> right? This is a uh, satin finish. And you just overlap a half lap. All right. Nice. Now later on you can come back in different lighting and everything else and double check. If you've got any flashy spots or dull spots, you can just hit it again because with a sprayer you don't get roller lines. Here we go. Spray shield next to my window. And then over here. And then over here. And across the bottom. Okay. Now, with the rest of this, start at the top around the ceiling and then work your way down, okay? Work your way around the room. Do the ceiling, do the wall. Just do one big clock circle motion and then uh, we're good to go. And you know, we can take care of all these details with the nails and the trims and the carpentry after the fact. All we have to do is prime the wood that we're gonna install or buy primed lumber. Oh, there. Pay close attention to these gaps, okay? If you're not happy with it, instead of going with blade this way, turn it upright and just give it a quick shot. Make sure they're full of paint, okay? You wanna keep about a 10, to, 10 to 12 inches off the wall and point this at the lead edge because what it does is it overlaps. It paints five or six inches and then gets second coats five or six inches. That's how you prime. All right, well, let's just go through a couple quick things you saw while I was doing that. Basically, we, we tried our best not to paint the fixtures, right? All of the light switches and stuff. And then we're gonna come back with the oil-based primer and then the uh, enamel paint to get those all touched up. So in this one, I painted the doors, I painted the handles, I painted the hinges. Because we're changing all of the doorknobs and the hinges. These things are still on the market. This isn't even a regular hinge. It's just a three-way hinge, okay? Check that out. This is standard in these houses, okay? These are not mortised into the door or the jam. They're all surface mounted. So you've got to go find yourself a mobile home supplier dealer because they have different thicknesses of doors. They've got different kinds of hinges. They have different vent cover sizes, okay? All of these things, you can't just pop down to the local hardware store. You've got to go to a specific supplier. So as long as you're doing that, you should have a lot of success. It's easy to change out the hardware after the fact. Let's not get worried about it right now. It's easy to paint a door while it's hanging. <laughs> Why move it? <laughs>
Now it's time for phase two in the prepping for our painting of the wall paneling in this bedroom. Um, step one was just simple, we sprayed, right? Nice and easy, uh, no big deal. It's been sitting for about a week. Okay, so there's the scratch test for you. Whew, I got hot. <laughs> and it's bonding really well. But what it is showing is that this being a glossy paint, it's showing us all of this embossed detail in the wood paneling that makes it look like real wood. It almost gives it a distressed look. It's really quite something. But it's also showing up all the joints. This is a joint, one panel the next, and it's showing all the staple heads. Okay, there's like a crown staple holding all this together. I'm gonna recommend when it comes time for your paint for your finish, you don't go with an eggshell. You gotta soften it up a little bit, all right? You don't wanna have anything that's an imperfection jumping off the wall. So consider going with a washable flat paint, all right? This will be key to getting a really good result because it's still a manufactured home. It's still wood paneling with lots of joints, okay? So you gotta do yourself a favor. And the less sheen that's in the paint, the less all of these imperfections are gonna show up and scream at you. So that'll be really good to know. Second thing we're gonna do here as part of our prep, we're gonna take some painter's caulking. This is just good old fashioned 25 year acrylic. It's just a few bucks a tube. And what we're doing with this is we're getting rid of all these you know, aggressive shadows. So I'm not gonna dab every nail head. I'm gonna let two coats of paint solve that problem. But what I'm gonna look at is trims like this, okay? Gaps like this that have really aggressive shadows. And I wanna get rid of that, all right? And I wanna just be fairly liberal with the caulking, all right? Get that in there, fill up that gap really well without too much run over, all right? You see, we're not trying to hide the fact that this is paneling. We're trying to beautify it. We're trying to say, hey, this is a wood wall, <laughs> right? Um, incorporate it and be proud of it, but we have to be subtle. We want to get rid of the deep crevices. We want to get rid of little imperfections that are reoccurring that are obviously man-made just by choosing the right paint and the right bit of prep. Now, I'm going to go around with my caulking. I'm not going to fill in the paneling grooves, okay? We're going to let the paint do that. The more texture we have on the wall, the better. It minimizes the effect of every other piece of texture. We just want to get rid of really deep, dark shadows because those things always look terrible in a paint job. Mm-hmm, I know, it's a bit messy. But it washes off with soap and water, so don't worry about it. This is not a silicone product at all, okay? It's just an acrylic caulking. You get the idea. Now, I'm gonna spend a couple of hours doing this. We also gotta address all of the holes that were made where they were hanging pictures. Ah, that's a frustration because that is not dirt. That's a hole. Take a little bit of your caulking and wipe that right into that, those holes. Every one of these little nail holes that they used to hang a picture. And I'm in trouble because in the hallway, it looked like they had um, uh, probably two or 300 pictures in there that had been reorganized a few times. <laughs> Might be easier to change the paneling. <laughs> Instead of using the gun and the tube to squeeze it in the hole, just create a bit of pressure so it's leaking. Beautiful. When we're done, release the pressure by squeezing this, this piece right here. One other shadow I want to address is right here. Let me just pull this forward a little bit. There we go. Right up under here, okay? So there's two other places we could cock. One is on the top, but no one's ever gonna see that. So don't worry about it. Remember the rule of life is when you're, when you're prepping for a paint job, you only want to fix up what people are gonna see. So if you're next to a stairwell, Above the doors, some of the doors, you've got to do the caulking and get up there and do a nice, perfect cut line. But in here, the only one you're going to see is on the bottom. So this is one line that we want to make sure we don't have a shadow. It makes this piece look much more integrated and intentional and not just something that's obviously covering a, a gap in the wood. That needs a nail. Good news, whenever I travel long distances, I always bring my air compressor with me, fully charged with my tire inflator on it. <laughs> A, because if I ever uh, hit a nail, I can pump it back up again. And B, because a compressor is one of the most important tools that you can own, especially when you're working on a job site and traveling around. You can always buy an air tool that'll match with the compressor for just about any situation that you're gonna face. Fortunately for me, I left in such a hurry because, <laughs> well, we got an appointment at the border to go and get our work visa. And so I didn't take enough time to go through the tools. I wish I'd thrown my Brad nailer in there. As it is, I'm gonna be just like everybody else, trying to do a project for the first time without a tool. And what Brad Neller did Jeff buy? 
I bought the cheapest one that was sitting on the shelf. You got it. I got the rigid, and that's okay. I actually don't mind this tool at all. I uh, use one for a lot of years. Big secret with rigid tools is when you buy it, take the information and register your purchase online. The lifetime warranty is only applicable to people that registered their tool when they bought it. Okay? You can't just walk into the store and say, hey, I got a rigid tool, it's not working, fix it or give me a replacement. You got to be registered or it doesn't count. All right? And they're going to want the serial number of the tool and all that wonderful stuff. And it's such a hassle, I never do it. Yeah, I know. I'm that guy. Well, that's a sleek new design, eh? Team gauge. It's already got this thing together. The one thing I like about the rigid, it stops working when it runs out of nails. Wonder if that's the case for this new model. I hope so, because that's the only thing about the DeWalt tool that drives me nuts. It makes just a slightly different sound when it runs out of nails. But if you're like me, you usually figure it out when you walk away and then the, tr the trim falls off the wall. Oh, that's an interesting little package of nails. There it is. And if you don't own a compressor and you want to get a good recommendation, this is it. This is the DeWalt trim compressor. This is incredibly quiet, so it won't drive you nuts, and it won't drive your neighbors nuts. And, not bad, eh? That'll take about three minutes to power up. I'm just admiring this tool for a second here. This is a nice newer model. It's got a belt clip that adjusts for left or right hand use. Not bad. It's got two spare tips. And this is important because uh, this is a magnesium housing, and so they'll dent just about anything they touch. All right, so that's nice to have those. And it has a depth setter on here. Yes, it does. And it also has a function to go from single to rapid fire. That doesn't mean you pull the trigger once and you get more than one nail. What it means is, I think you can just pull the trigger and every time you touch it, a nail comes out. So that's on, all right? There you go. And I have to adjust my depth setting just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I uh, don't like that function because I have a habit of hitting my leg. <laughs> yeah, learn that one the hard way. All right. You leave it on single, then you have to actually compress it and then shoot the nail, okay? Like, I can't just go like this and touch. Nothing happens. All right. That's the safest way for homeowners to use it. Leave it on one shot. You have to depress the mechanism and then pull the trigger. Okay? That's a safe way to use it. Uh, the other way is for production. But as homeowners, we're not worried about production as much as staying out of the hospital. <laughs> I might as well put this trim on over here. I salvage this. I'm going to cover this nasty joint. And then, hopefully, we'll get some caulking on here. And then this will look a lot better. There we go. There's something to be said when you're tearing things apart. Try to keep them in as original condition as possible. You never know when you might need it again later. All right, now we got the caulking done. I do have to make sure I'm conscious of my order of things. I do have a wall that I'm doing a textured finish on. If that's not finished yet. First of all, I got my measurement here. Okay, we got that one. Whenever you're doing new construction, sometimes there's always gonna be a little bit of work that has to be done out of order. Minor changes, adjustments, you know what it is. Ah. Now that's just a primer I threw on there, a little bit of kills, because I don't want to have to prime it up against my new wall there. Try to find everywhere where there's wood, so we're not attaching it to just the paneling. Even though we're spray painting wood paneling, we still need the same, because you never know. Yeah, like there's actually a hair there. Imagine that. Now, it's a rule. Whenever you paint, always sand between your coats, between your primer, between your first and second. Uh, it's just the best process possible. There's always dirt and debris flying around. Now, I've already taken the time to sweep and vacuum the room, so it shouldn't be that bad. But here I am, you know, just follow the process and you'll never be disappointed. All right guys, well here we are. This is the X5. I just finished using this machine to paint the entire exterior of the house. This is my waste can, okay? So here's what happens. The second line you throw in your waste can when you're gonna change a paint, all right? And here is my new paint that I'm gonna be using. And they were somewhat similar in design, so I'm not gonna worry about a little contamination. Because this is a pump and it's full of paint, this machine works this way. This one pulls, 
and this one sends. And if you put them in the same can, when you're applying your paints, everything's fine. But when you want to clean the pump out and switch your paint over, then what you do is you take this line, you throw it in here, and then we're going to turn the paint on, turn the pump on, and we're going to fill it up with brand new paint. Okay? This will be interesting. Here we go. See? And what I'm waiting for here is this creamy color to show up in my can. Ooh, there it's dripping out just now. There we go. There we go. So now we'll put this one in here with the other one. Okay, good to go. Load up, close up my, my other gallon here. The only place that the paint hasn't been switched over is in my nozzle. So I'm going to take this old dried out can and then I'm going to fill this up with the old paint until I see the new color coming through. In order to do this, I'm going to turn this all the way down to the slowest speed. So I'm not spraying too much paint out at once. We're waiting until we see that creamy color coming out. There we go. There is the creamy color coming now. Oh yeah, perfect. Mission accomplished. All right, and that is how you fill the pump and the line, and you've switched over from one paint to the next. So you can go from a primer to ceiling paint and then switch to wall paint. Follow those steps and you're ready to go. That's really all there is to know, except for, I'm gonna turn our pressure back up a little bit, okay? Um, when you're painting in small spaces like closets or cabinets, turn the pressure down so you don't get so much back pressure. And then, uh, really, it's just aim and shoot. I'm gonna finish up this closet and then I'm gonna talk about the specifics of the process with you in just a minute. All right, here we go. The only thing you really gotta have is a system because you're gonna wanna do two coats. So I like to go horizontal on my first coat and then vertical on my second coat, all right? Um, I got a clog. I'm gonna take this nozzle, turn it around, shoot it out. We should be right back in business. There it is. Well, that's the first coat for the closets done. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Now it's time for our caulking. Okay. We can set our watch to about 20 minutes, and then I'll be all dry. So the goal is to start on the other side of the room, work our way back around, and we don't have to worry about if that's perfectly 20 minutes or not. Because we're spraying and not rolling, we're not gonna pull that cogging out even if it's still not perfectly dry. You're gonna see that in situations like this, I've got ceiling, and I've got trims, right? This is the trim, grates. The trim and the grates, the door, they're all gonna be a different color. So my job here is to try to get as much of this coverage as possible without wrecking that finish. <laughs> so what I want to do here is um, I want to spray with my line to just the bottom of the trim, intentional, so that there's a very minimal overspray. And I'm going to take my brush out and trim out all the trim in this room afterwards. Let's see if we can start here and we'll see if we can find ourselves a decent line to work with. Here we go. Right there. Okay. Done. All right, that's the secret. You start, find your line, and that's it, all right? You don't want to waste your paint by painting everything else in the room. And this little bit here I can touch up later with a brush. I'm also planning on changing out all the hinges, so don't worry about that. This is the kind of gun you want to do for production painting, right? This is not uh, cut and roll. This is not fancy schmancy. This is get the damn place painted and then we'll worry about some trims afterwards because this is all about get it or done. And take your time. Um, try to keep everything straight at 90 to the wall. If you're spraying on an angle, then, then, then push, the, push it along the wall like this. So if I'm gonna be in a, in a tight corner, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint like this. All right, and you always 
pull the trigger after you start moving and release when, you, when you're still moving. Okay, but by that I mean this. You're moving, okay, that's how you paint, all right? That way you never start with a big bunch and you don't finish with a big bunch. You're always moving when your hand's on the trigger, all right? Do about a 50% overlay. There we go. And if there's something that you're not happy with, let it dry, come back. If you try to fix something right away because you missed the spot, you're gonna end up with drips. Better put a wet coat over a dry coat than a wet coat on another wet coat. Always remember, check your paint regularly. If it gets too low, it starts sucking air, and then it gets air in the pump and air in the line, and then it'll just die out on you, okay? So then you gotta go, while it's pumping air, you gotta run over there to turn it off real quick. <laughs> What you want to do is keep an eye on it. Make sure your can's always more than half full. And then that'll never suck the air into the line and cause you that issue. Um, remember when you get started, it takes about one quart just to fill the pump in the line before you even start painting. So it doesn't take long that you have to get back on there to put some more in the gallon. So there's no such thing as spray painting a one gallon because you have about a quarter of a gallon sitting there when it stops working. Then you got a quarter of a gallon sitting in the line. That only gives you half a gallon to paint a room. So consider that, you know, this isn't, the, this isn't the process if you're only doing one room. But if you're like me and you're renovating a whole house or you're doing a basement, time is money. That wall only has one coat and that darker color will cover with one coat when I do my second coat. That's why I did that first coat there, doing the rest of this room and then I'll finish with the accent wall again. That way I can cut the lines and add the trims, make everything look perfect. All right, well, there's something oddly satisfying about watching paint dry. Um, in this back wall, we're in a double wide trailer, so that's actually vinyl covered wallpaper. So it's gonna take about two hours to dry, even though we use the air sprayer. So uh, instead of making you sit and watch the paint dry with me for the next two hours, we'll call that a day. I'm gonna just show you a couple of tricks now with dealing with subfloor. Room's almost done. I've gotta do this corner. It's, it's a little maddening to me, but the, the cable that comes to the house comes to the master bedroom first, and then it's split and this line ends up going to two other locations, one in the front room and one in the other bedroom. I mean, I don't know why I would think that they would go to the living room first, but I guess one place is just as good as another, but it is a crawl space and I don't like crawling around. So I am gonna be very careful not to damage any of this, but I wanna make sure that my subfloor that I'm putting in um, has some integrity in this corner because I can foresee people using furniture and we don't wanna not have plywood around here. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna measure it and I'm gonna drill two holes. I bought some Diablo speedboard bits. These are amazing, okay? They fit in my one drill that I have with me that is starting to give up the ghost. It's just getting old like me, I guess. I always use a nice sharp knife to cut these open. This packaging is more dangerous than the tools you use on the job site, I'm telling you. This one cable is kinda of comes together. And is it gonna be big enough to cover? Yeah, we can squeeze that in. All right, good. We'll use one drill bit. We're going to measure to this seam. Okay, that is the middle of a floor joist. There's no sense going any further than that because we're gonna be adding flooring and we're gonna be adding baseboard. So to go to that seam, it looks like a 48 piece. It is perfect. So I got a 48 by 48, nice and simple. This is gonna work just marvelous. This is why you need something that's square, guys. 43 and a quarter to the middle of that one. This one is going to be 46. And then we're going to get the measurement off the other side as well for both of these holes. 46 and an eighth. That is spooky. All right. And 45 and a quarter. So now I can translate that information. This is factory edge. That's just nasty to look at, isn't it? All right. All right. That'll be better. So my holes are gonna go somewhere here and here, okay? So now we take that information, 43 and a quarter, 46 and an eighth, okay? And then 46 and an eighth, and then 45 and a quarter, second center.
this in here. Let's get this one in here. It's nice that they're super long. This makes this uh, a lot easier, actually. You know, this lined up. Come around the other side. It's a bit of a pinch here. There. Okay. And remember, we are screwing right through the floor. Subfloor, the subfloor, and then into the joist. Now we can push all that excess back. Because when we're installing the flooring, we're not going to want to have 400 feet of cable here. But in the meantime, I need to have this connected because this is the internet for the house. It's also the power that I need to be doing my live shows. So the single wire is the cable power coming in. I just don't know which one of these goes to the front room versus the other bedroom, so we'll just put them both on. <laughs> so one of the really fancy things about these manufactured homes, none of the door hinges are mortised. You can see that these all sit on the surface. Even this plate sits on the surface. Which, you know what? In the grand scheme of things, when you're dealing with a hollow door, it's not that big of a problem. Well, those, some of those screws are really interesting. Eh? Um, <laughs> it's only carrying, what's this door? Maybe 30 pounds? Not even? There's four screws carrying 30 pounds. That really, you know, shouldn't be an issue. <sighs> Make life a lot simpler if all doors are not mortised like that. If they're hollow. But anyway, there's two things we got to do to prep. Because I'm trying to bring the subfloor from here. There's a joist here. You can see the red line. The next one, I don't know where it is. It's underneath that flooring somewhere. And I can't install the flooring in this room unless I have subfloor through the door. And I don't want to have a weak spot by stopping in the middle of, a, of the original subfloor where there's no joist. So I actually have to remove the flooring in the hallway now. And there's no easy way to do that. It's going to be messy. This is a construction zone. So <laughs> let's just get the... Uh, Let's get the big tools out. And it's just a vinyl tongue and groove lock. Shouldn't take much. So you peel that up. How much of a hole did you repair here? Okay. Oh my. Somebody did a majority of the hallway. Huh. Well, isn't that interesting? So that changes the story on this house a little bit, doesn't it? Because this was carpet. So whoever put down the vinyl knew they were having subfloor issues. Peeled up the old one and put this plywood in. But it's soft down here. So they stopped somewhere in the hallway. Oh, wow. Wow. Vinyl flooring has certain installations um, environments, shall we say, where it's starting to fail. The floor I'm standing on is only three years old. I want you to check this out right here where I'm walking. Okay, look at that. Look at that floor move. All right. Now, when it first happened, we're like, okay, soft spot. Uh, how bad can this be? <laughs> and then we started doing the demolition. In Florida, you have two climates, warm and dry and hot and humid. What we want to consider is the following. During the warm and dry period, having a vinyl floor doesn't affect the house. But during the hot, humid period, we want to stop and go, okay, let's put our building science hats on. If something in this building gets wet, how does it dry? Well, in the summertime, you're running air conditioning constantly, okay? So the air inside this building envelope is always quite dry. So if water gets into the building, as long as it can make its way into the building space, past the surface of the walls, right? Which is why going from oil to latex made a lot of sense because moisture could pass through a latex wall without damaging anything and, and relative humidity would take care of any moisture that got into your building. But underneath this crawl space, there's just hot, humid air. So we have to stop and think, wait a minute, if I'm putting vinyl on top of my subfloor and the subfloor is pulling humid air from underneath, where's all that water going? And we're talking six months of the year. It's just going into that subfloor and it's got nowhere to get out. All right? That's a serious problem. Point is this. 
Now when I'm walking around, I'm identifying soft spots on the floor, okay? That were probably already soft, but we never noticed on the first trip through. And I was looking for problems, right, when we bought this place. But now there's soft spots, and it's still winter time. It's not even hot and humid yet, but this material had soaked up so much moisture that it was weakened because it's not plywood. Okay, well, now we know. It's just no accountability for integrity these days. So they knew they had a problem, they patched the worst part, and left the rest to rot underneath a brand new floor. Whew. Wow, that's just nasty. That is just, that's just sad. Somebody probably made a, uh, an economic decision. And it wasn't a good one. Uh, oh well, no big surprise, right? You know, let me know in the comment section if you think I'm being weird. If you were the contractor and the client said, hey, I can't give you ten or $15,000 to put new subflooring in, uh, can you just patch the bad spots? Would you do that? Knowing that the client was going to end up falling through the floor in another part of the house sooner or later anyway. I just feel like the conversation should have been <laughs> You're throwing good money down the drain by getting this job done. Okay, so here's the good point. The good news is, this is plywood. It's 5 8 It's just like we're using. So I can make my joint finish anywhere here. I was, uh, I was going to try to find the joist. And I can. It's right here. There's one here. And I'm just guessing because I'm not seeing enough fixed fasteners. Maybe I can see through the gap here. Yes, I can see the gap. Okay, now remember this is uh, double wide, which means it's two houses stuck together to make the whole home. So this is where the trailers meet, and this is where we got five aids meeting up with the old material again. If I sound exasperated, because I am, <laughs> I, I hate seeing things like this. Anyway, I understand how they happen. Um, my job here is to teach you a couple of things. One, what we would do if this wasn't plywood. Okay, because that other subfloor wasn't structural. So I'd be looking for joists, okay, uh, this joist. Remember, this flooring came right up to here. This is the old flooring line. So I wasn't sure if, where the next joist was. And what I wanted to do is, I'm basically gonna measure a piece of plywood that fits this whole area, and I was gonna make a shape like this. Comes around the door, okay? Same thing on this side, and I was gonna make that puzzle piece to go from floor joist to floor joist, okay? That's the plan. And the way you work that is you cut it in half and you slide one piece in and slide the other piece in. It's a little bit of measuring and that's not a big issue. What you need is you gotta get a square, you throw it on here, you draw your center line and you measure from that line all your different other points to get all these different points of measurement. That's pretty straightforward and simple. Then you can cut it, drop it in. And again, you have a little mercy because you don't have to go right up tight to the wall, right? The other thing we're gonna do is because we're making a change to upgrade all of these door casings and we're gonna put baseboards in instead of pieces of cord around, we also wanna remove that from the equation here. All right? So that we're not trying to cut around all of those details as well. All right, oh, of course, use lots of nails. All right, so now, once that's done, I can measure something that would look like this. Okay, and come right across the corner, up to about the door, and that's what I was looking to do. Something like that. Plus, I had to finish this line on the next floor joist, which was over here somewhere. But because I'm on structural plywood now, I'm gonna stop at the door, make my life simple, Come over to this door. I'm gonna do the puzzle piece, give you an idea of what we're up against. But this is a proper way to add subflooring around existing door. You don't need to cut the jams out of the way. What we're gonna do is when we get to the flooring section of this video, we're going to cut back these little pieces here and install the flooring right tight to the jam. Okay, remember it's vinyl. So it's not gonna expand and contract. You're not gonna run into issues. 
and we'll leave the subfloor a little bit shy but put the vinyl right up nice and tight finish this piece here with a little bit of colored caulking and then put, finish this piece here with the casing and the baseboard covering all that gap so it'll, it'll get a really nice finished look all right that's the goal anyway to try to make it look pretty all right here we go let's just finish ripping all this out and then we can go ahead and measure that man that is frustrating here we go get underneath I guess for me, I'm, now that I'm here, I'm just really curious as to, did they run that plywood? No, that's the particle board again. Or is it? No, they did. They changed the plywood in the bathroom too. That's actually really interesting. If the whole bathroom's been changed, we'll find out later on, because we're going to get to this bathroom later. If that whole bathroom's been changed out, um, then I'll be stopping the subfloor here and transitioning down into the bathroom. I'm not going to bother putting new plywood on top of new plywood if I don't have to. That'll be uh, possibly handy dandy. But like I said, until we see it, we don't know. Because eight feet away, they didn't change the plywood out and there's a bunch of bad spots opening up the floor, causing damage. So I don't know what they were thinking. They, were, they weren't thinking about the whole job, that's for sure. Man, you put down a floor, you want more than three years out of it. Wow. Beware, when you're doing DIY projects, you have to start from the beginning. And that is making sure that you're building on something that's structural that's going to last longer than you are. And that's not the case here, which is sad. All right, let's get to measuring. I need my square. Uh, here we go. First thing we need is um, an arbitrary line here. Some sort of measurement that comes off of this trim that's the narrowest part of this part of the room. And we're going to call that 18 inches. And we're going to put that right there. Okay, we'll come off this side because this has got a bit of an issue. We're not going to get a square line. My bad. So there we go. We'll go 18 inches from here and a hair, and that'll be our cut line. Okay, center, we're calling that 18 inches uh, from that side. Okay, so this measurement from here to here is going to be 18, and this measurement, and this is how we do it, is going to be 7. Sorry, it'll be 18 as well. I actually picked the center of the wall. That's just absolutely crazy. Now, from door jam to door jam out here, I think it's gonna be a little bit wider. Yeah, that's 40. Okay. So this one is 40. And so that really makes things interesting. Now, we have to get these points here, okay? In order to do that, we're just gonna extend this line all the way out and then measure from the line back to all those points. All right, so. We'll bring, I didn't take the casings off here, did I? Now, we're gonna bring the flooring to here. It's still 18, and it's close enough, okay? So we'll still call that 18. That will stay the same. The door itself, we're gonna come up to this space here. That one's 13, we'll call that one 14. All right, so this is 14. This, I'm gonna go 12 and 7 eighths because it was just a little tight. Okay, so now from here, 21, 24 and 3 quarters. This is this line, 21, 24 and 3 quarters. And we'll measure the same off over here. Similar, 21, 25, 21 and an eighth. 25 and then my total length is going to be we're going to go to 30 inches okay so the piece of plywood i'm working with is going to be a 30 by 40. i'm going to draw that center line on okay i don't even know if it's center let's try this 21 and a half okay 21 and a half and 18 and a half Okay, so it's not center. It's center in there, but it's not center out here. That is why we have to start with a 40 by 30, and then we have to get this intersection on there. We're gonna draw this line on our cut piece of plywood, and then we'll draw all of our measurements out according to that. And then we're gonna cut it in half and drop it in. And with a little bit of luck, it should be perfect the first time. Perfect every time. So here we go, that's my 40. I'm just feeling like that square isn't very square anymore. <laughs> It'll be close enough. 
All right, so now I got my 40 and my 30, and my center line here was 21 and a half, right there. And I'm working off the factory edge here, so I can try to keep this as square as possible. Now, let's put this on the line. This is the bedroom, and I'm in the hall, so I've got the same situation as I was taking all my measurements. So I know I'm coming across 18, and come down 21 and an eighth, I'm coming down 12 and 7 eighths off that line. That represents my door jam. 25 on the other side. It's all the way across to there. And that's three and a half. Now the other side. This should be 18 as well. Pretty darn close. And we're coming down 21. Yeah, so this is the 40. This is the same wall in the other room. But the inside measurement is a little bit skinnier than in the hallway. So we're going to make an account for this because I don't want to be running into issues. Now, coming from that line, I was over here at 14. And then the next line down here is 24 and 3 quarters to my 40. So whenever you're in doubt and you got a fancy puzzle piece, just draw up an arbitrary line on a whole number, mix it help. Draw that square across and then use this. Factory edge against factory edges, okay? Always drawing. Off that square, get all your measurements. Now all we gotta do is cut this bad boy. All right. And <laughs> now we find out if I know what I'm doing. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to start this way, okay, and we'll slide this one in, all right, that's on that line, that's looking pretty good so far, we'll slide this one in, there's nothing to shake a stick at, brilliant, okay, the only thing I'm not crazy about is the gap here, knowing that I'm trying to catch a joist, because I'm picky and I've got a little bit of room to maneuver, I am going to make this adjustment right here, and take off that quarter inch just so that I can close this gap and stay nice and tight and square. All right. Taking the time to be picky like this is the difference between a job that really performs well or a warranty road, warranty issue down the road. There we go. Now that is gonna to screw together really nice and tight. Oh, beautiful. Perfect every time. Uh, guys, remember, since the joists are running this way, I've only gotta add screws every 16 inches on those joist lines, okay? So what I'm gonna do, just make my life easier, and identify that joist line, I'm gonna mark it on the board. Mark it on the wall. Make it easy to connect those dots once you get all your subfloor in place. So here we go, right? Nice and simple. And then now that I'm on to subflooring over here, that's just about laminating it together. And uh, problem solved. Okay guys, welcome to the cutting room. I gotta set up a cutting station in this environment because honestly, uh, we're gonna be cutting particle board and you don't wanna be in the same room as particle board when you're cutting it. Because uh, the installation, like I don't mind coming out here and make a mess and then go and do all the assembly in a nice clean environment. But if I'm in that mess all day long, then I've got to get masks on and you know my camera guy's got to wear masks all day long and we're just going to do some cutting real quick. We're going to make the boxes, we're going to cut our French cleat and then we're going to go and do the installation in the other room where it's nice and clean. And that is why I'm not wearing a mask today. Hopefully you can all accept that. The French cleat is really simple. What we're going to do here just to be able to put this together is I'm going to screw this down and then I'm going to rip it by freehand, okay? So let me just get a couple of screws and the drill. I'm going to be basically just screwing in one inch of this material into the two by six 
Ah, piece of cake. Now, in order to do a rip for our French cleat, we have to change the angle on the saw. We're going to go to 45 degrees. Okay. You also want to double check now off the, off the plate. Is that deep enough to cut through the material? And it looks like it's sitting at about an inch, but I'm going to give myself a little more space just to be clear, sure on that. This plate is right here. This notch is when I'm cutting material when the blade is square off. When I'm cutting on a 45, this notch right here is where the blade is going to be cut, penetrating the material. And it's three quarter inch thick, and so it'll be coming out on the bottom side three quarter inches this way. So I want to make sure that I leave enough material here. I got about an inch on the other side. That gives me something I can screw to from both pieces when I'm building my, my, my closets. And here we go. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to be holding my, the tip of my finger right here, way far away from the blade. Don't get worried. And I'm going to just run it right down the middle. Now the reason you don't have to be exact and use a table saw on this is because the, they mirror each other. Okay, so even if the cut is wobbly, the same piece of the bottom will line up with the same piece on the top, on the, on the cabinet side. So we're not going to worry about that. Now here we go. Three quarters I said, right? So one inch there. Boom. Now, the secret here is I know I'm going to be cutting this in a few different places. What I want to do is I want to just put um, A on the wood. That one's going to be about 40 inches, the first cabinet. And so then the second cabinet is from here. This will be B. And then this will be C. Okay? So I know how this all works. I'm not going to get lost in translation somewhere along the way. Now, this one gets mounted right on the wall. Okay, so this is the wall surface, and then there's an angle. And so then the next piece will sit down in it, and that'll carry the weight, and it'll pull it nice and tight towards the wall. That's as simple as that, okay? I'm gonna set this aside to cut my cleats into the finished box. Um, I can use my chop saw to cut the, this piece and make it perfect, so that's probably gonna need precision. Building the boxes, I'm doing freehand because I don't have all the tools. And uh, I'm not in the mood to buy any today. I just wanted to make this quick, simple cabinet system for you guys. Here's my design, all right? Uh, I wrote this out on a, basically a napkin, right? It's not that tricky. Let's get uh, box number one built now. It's going to be a 40 inch tall by 40 box. The concept of the design is simple. I'm making a box, it's a square with a piece of French cleat on it and a shelf in the very bottom. And I'm gonna put a hanging rod two locations, okay? And we're gonna be mounting this um, high enough up on the wall, uh, closer to um, uh, closer to seven feet on the ceiling, okay? So that we have 36 inches of space, and then 36 inches of space, and then there's still room before the floor. Okay, makes sense? So we wanna to go to seven feet, almost seven feet on the wall. This way you can get two, twice as much closet space on a wall. That's all, piece of cake. Now, I am looking to get uh, something cut exactly 40 inches and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be using the 2x4s here just to keep my saw from cutting my desk. Alright, here's my material. And I'm, I'm going big too. Because my colitis is so deep, I'm actually going big. You don't have to. You can go and get the 12 inch material. I actually was uh, looking to do some 12 inch shelving in there as well, but <sighs> at last there is no 12 inch melamine in the market right now. It's amazing when there's a supply chain shortage, the decisions that are made at head office. And the decision is, well, if we don't have the ability to make all of the stuff we need, let's make the most expensive one and let them cut it down. Let's let them spend more money than they need to get the material they want and throw a bunch of stuff in the garbage. But at least we get paid, right? What a great way to mark up a one, <laughs> one by 12. And that is to make them all one by 16. For me, I'm lucky because I can put in 16 inch shelving in my closet, I don't care. But for a lot of other people, 
That's going to be maddening. Now, we want a 40 inch piece. Let's first of all mark 40 inches. This is as simple as it gets, guys. 40 inch tall is right there. Okay? And I'm going to do that over here as well. And always mark exactly where you want it. Take a triangle, buy a big one, okay? This is the DeWalt, it's 12 inch. Um, they don't, I mean, I could have a 16 or a 24, but I don't. So we have to cut this twice, and that's fine. Hey, uh, we're gonna put this right near the cut so that I can hold this steady while I'm cutting. I like that. Okay, now, key. We want this to be thick enough to cut the material only. Okay, there we go. About an inch and a quarter is plenty. It's a three quarter inch material. Mm. Set the blade and then plug it in. Don't do what I do. <laughs> now, just to be clear, the edge of that material is zero. I put a black marker line on it because that's the thickness of my blade. So if I want exactly 40 and I'm cutting on the finished side, I can't put the edge of the saw there or I'm going to get 39 and 7 8. I have to put the, that there because I want that pencil mark to be just barely visible so I have a 40 inch piece. So what I do is I put my saw where I want it so when I'm done cutting the material away I have the right measurement. The other way to do it would be to measure from the left side which would be simpler and then I can put that right on that mark. But I'm making it painful today. Here we go. Now I'm going to Squeeze this in place. This is my guard. Okay, I'm going to be running this part of the plate up against that. And that's all you got to do to make a straight line. Remember, we don't start cutting until up here. So we're going to line up for the blade depth. I'm liking that. I'm squeezing it. I'm going to turn this on and get going. Well, that was disappointing. Is that a scratch or what happened there? What you're going to notice is these panels come with one finished edge. That's the front. So that's the front. That's great. And because we're only putting a rod in here, I don't have to worry about buying the one with the holes. I'm not adding shelving into these scenarios. I'm just putting a one shelf down here at this point just for stability and one across the top. So we'll set that aside. And I need another 40 inch piece. This time I'll measure from the right direction. There we go. This time we'll put the plate right on the line. There's number two. Wow, that's almost perfect. All right. Um, by the way, almost perfect is still perfect. Next, the that's the two sides. I'm also making this cabinet 40 inches wide because. Like I said in the beginning of the video, we're going to put the tower in the middle, right? And so we'll start with a 40, make the tower, and then we'll make a precise measurement and use the angle of the room and all that jazz for the last piece. But the first two, we're just going to build right here, right off of my design. Um, and so I need another piece at 40. I'm going to show you another trick here that will help make your life easier. I probably should have done it the first time, but I didn't. Listen, this is not an ideal setup. <laughs> It's just the best that I could come up with on site at the last minute without spending a fortune. My piece is going to be 40. The off cut here is garbage. No good to me, right? So it's an 8 foot board. I'm going to cut at 48 first. What that's going to do is it's going to give me the ability to measure left to right both times. And it's going to make my off cut so small that it, I don't risk breaking the board as I'm cutting it through. Okay, so let's just get that set up. Let's cut that one. Give or take here is easier. All right. Now when I measure off my 40, you can see I'm only having a few inches of off cut here. That's good. Okay. Just to keep my life organized. Okay. I'm going to write on here top, all right? And the reason I'm doing that is because now I get to measure exactly for my rail, my French cleat. And look at that, it's exactly 40. I guess that actually works. Very cool. Here's my cleat. 
Okay. And this is the first cabinet A, marked on my cleat. And the inside dimension of this is exactly 40. All right, so here's how this cabinet's gonna work. We got gables, and this is carrying all of the weight, all right? So when you're building boxes, if you put a shelf across the top like this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna help keep it from going, moving around if there's a piece on the side as well, okay? But if all we have is four pieces, top and bottom, and then the two gables, all right? It's not strong enough. So now we've got introduced this French cleat, okay? And that's gonna sit on here something like, like this, I guess, eh? Yeah, there we go. And that helps a little bit, but it's not gonna be perfect. So we also wanna cut something that's 40 inches long out of that one by four for the bottom, because when I build this thing, my shelf is gonna be three and a half inches off there, okay? So that the rod can be attached underneath. So for stability, we'll have the French cleat at the top, we'll have four sides, but to keep this thing from rocking around too much, I'm gonna cut another piece of one by four, exactly the 40 inch, so that we can assemble it. Now, I'm gonna take all of this material into the other room where I've got a table set up and we can actually assemble this thing and get it hung. I've made a couple of errors. We're just gonna run through them really quickly. One of them is, I have two sides, I've got a top, and I've decided I wanna put the top on the top. That's 40, that's my measurement. That's what I'm going with, and my French cleat. I'm gonna run into a design problem. I'm gonna show you how to fix it. Hi, yi yi. let me just cut this and we'll go back to the assembly table and I'll explain it there. It'll make a lot more sense and trying to explain it here where you can't see it all going together, okay? This shelf is gonna go inside the gables on a 40 inch cabinet, so I need to take an inch and a half off. And that's what I'm doing right now. I okay. need to create a notch or a recess in the gables where I'm hanging this, okay? And I'm going to create one and three quarters on both sides. Okay, that's the size of that. So here's the front of the gable. This is the back, obviously. And I need to create a notch for my French cleat to be installed. One and three quarters. In order to do that, I need my jigsaw. And this is what you get when you're traveling for 20 bucks. Trying to keep my costs down after all. Uh, I am close to being on budget on this build. So, Every little bit helps. And here we are. That's why I am working with basic tools today. Now, depending on the store you shop at, um, it's nice, they usually sell this material in six foot lengths. So I'm making a six foot box, which would make life really easy. But uh, unfortunately, where I went, I went to both the hardware stores here in town. And at that point I was done shopping. I don't like to spend all day look, looking for material. I'd rather just cut something <laughs> instead of shopping. But here we are. This is an interesting panel. It comes with the holes pre-drilled for the shelf clips. Be careful, there's two standard hole sizes out there, quarter inch or five millimeter. That, you heard me right, I'm now down here in the United States and they sell five millimeter hole clips. This is drilled out of five millimeters. Don't know why we're using that measurement, but it's just the way she goes. Keep that in mind. You know, you can't just buy what looks like a shelf clip and it works every time. There's two different dimensions in the market. A lot of interesting standards out there. Now, this is my cut line for six feet, okay? I'm gonna start by just ripping off the excess. This is garbage. So we'll get rid of the extra because I don't wanna have that much weight. It'll increase the likelihood that something's gonna break and then I'm out 30 bucks, right? That would really suck. Now we can actually cut this thing properly. Get it right on the line. I'm gonna mark the bottom with a B. It's just pencil, I'll wipe off with a wet cloth later. 
but we want to make sure that we, when we go to assemble this in the other room, that uh, we don't get confused, right? Number one, I have to add our notches because we're going to continue with the French cleat cut into the back of these things. So let's get that out. Here's the front. This is the back here. All right. We might as well finish doing the whole panel before we move on. It's going to be attached on top of the gables. And so my French cleat will be exactly the same size. A absolute hair, just under 24. This is cabinet number B. So here we are, just a hair under 24. Okay, so now we're gonna do the bottom shelf. And this is not gonna go underneath, it'll go in, in between, all right? So we're gonna do a series of shelves now. Because we're doing a shelf system, they all need to be exactly the same size, which is gonna be interesting. So, the one on the bottom, we're gonna make it 22 and a half, which is the perfect size of this box. And then all the shelves I cut from here on in are gonna be 22 and 15 sixteenths. All right, so that they sit on the pins easy. And there's always gonna be just a little bit of wiggle room you don't want to be sitting there like forcing all that in if you want to move them around. So this one is going to be just a hair bigger than the shelves. Now it's kind of a shame I should show you this. You're going to get a kick out of it. I was at the store and they sold these pre-done edges, right? Perfect shelves. <laughs> I can't use this because it's only sold in 12 inch and all the rest of the material was sold in 16 inch. But I wanted to get one of these and show you. Um, if you're lucky enough to find this and you make it out of 12 inch, there's your shelf. Done. Just make your box a, a, an eighth of an inch wider when you're, when you're building and you can buy these and just drop them in. That would be a great time saver. All right. Whew, that is noisy, eh? Ah, uh, yes, sir. 22 and a half and a hair. Okay, now remember when you're cutting, um, because the blade on the saw goes in this direction, okay, counterclockwise, it's cutting a clean underneath line. Here's my surface lines. You can see the chip's a little bit easier against white. So that's minor chipping. Now, here's the side, the underside of that same piece. Nice and clean. When you're building, always put the nice clean side up top. I'll be putting this side up, but there's a cheat for this because when I'm all finished, I can actually take a little bit of white silicone and do a thin bead in the corner and no one will ever see the chips. But just keep it in mind, um, when you're working like this, not having that material drop is gonna be really important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab another two by four, cut another block so I can have it on the other side and put another one over here. So it's all resting in place when I'm cutting. And I think that is going to eliminate that damage. I can measure from this edge. And remember, this one was what? 22 and a half and a hair. We want our shelves to be exactly 22 and a half, maybe even just a little bit under. So I'm just gonna put the pencil just to the left of my 22 and a half. So that way I'm eating up the width of the blade in addition. And that should make it perfect for us. Now, So that saves us from having the damage issue. The question is, yeah, perfect. All right. Now, you would think that I could be able to just take this piece, stick it on here, trace the line and cut it and repeat and repeat. What that ends up doing is it ends up making every piece sequentially larger. Okay, we don't want to do that. You want to take the time to measure these off one at a time. We're just going to mark it shelf. Okay, and we'll keep doing that until we get four more. Now here in our design sequence, our first box, remember we've got a one by four underneath over here for that, keep it from swaying action. And we're gonna do the same on this. So what we wanna do is have that one by four in the back of this box here as well. So when you're looking at the wall, it looks like it's all one piece. 
tricky, tricky. But this one's already hung, so we already got the measurement. So what we're going to do is we're just going to cut and measure this, confirm it on site while I'm assembling it, but it should not be an issue. I am 22 and a half. We're going to confirm that with the other bottom piece. Oh, perfect. Okay. Now we're ready to go build the box. Okay, guys, here's one of these moments where um, <clears throat> I get to eat a little crow and you get to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> now, I caught myself. I was like, oh, I've got a notch for my... And I'm sure a bunch of you in the comments are already going, that's not going to work, Jeff. You're a dummy. And you're right. It won't. I'm not accounting for the fact that there's going to be the bottom part attached to the wall, which makes it three and a half inches. Plus, I need a little more mercy so I can start high and then drop it down. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this down to five and a half inches. So I got a two inch mercy. I can finish this cut all the way down. And then what's going to happen is I'll have the French cleat, which will represent that piece. Okay. And then I'll have another piece of wood that'll cover the gap. All right. And that's the way it's going to have to be. We'll do it on French cleats. We'll hang everything. Then I can still do the floor later. Right. I'll leave a gap. You know what? There's situations in life where this is going to be beneficial. Uh, maybe not ideal in every scenario. And if you need to have a simpler system to follow. I have another video where I did this, uh, a similar kind of closet build for my daughter. And we'll put that video link in the description below. Everything there is sitting on the ground and it makes life a little bit simpler because you can go with the stock shelves and the stock, everything's stock. You don't have to cut it all. All right. It's a much faster assembly. You might be asking me, well, Jeff, if you're just hanging it on the wall, why didn't you just buy the system from Home Depot? Like there's two or three different products out there in each of the major stores, right? And what you're going to find out is um, the material that they're using is half inch and this is three quarter. And I don't like working with half inch material because that to me is just cheap and it doesn't going to last. The other thing is they're about, I'm going to build a box right now. And every box in those systems runs two to 300 bucks. Every box that I'm building runs about 40 to 50 bucks. So if I'm making four boxes, I'm saving myself almost a thousand bucks. And this build, the, the whole double wide trailer renovation, it's all about the money. We're trying to keep our budget under, you know, the $20,000 mark. So when your focus is a budget, you're going to make decisions that follow that, right? You're not going to take the easy way out and buy a pre-made product and just screw it all together and stick it on a wall. Here we go. This is how you save money. Now this overcut here, I'm not worried about it. Um, it will be covered by the two pieces of one by four. And here we go, one down. Just to make my life simple, I'm gonna use a combination of air tools and screws to pre-drill, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna just Hold these pieces together nice and flush. Pop a pin in. Okay. And increase my pressure. I'm not happy with that. I want to get over 120. There. Now the head should be sinking as well. This is the front of the cabinet. That's the back of the cabinet. Just want to make sure we think of this. When you look in the cabinet, you want to be able to see the slope of the cut wood. Okay. This needs to be visible to you physically or it's on backwards. <laughs> All right. And again, we're just going to tack this together real quick and then we'll throw the screws in. Now what I'm creating here is an L shape by screwing this all together. And what that's going to do is going to provide a lot more strength as far as transfer to the gable ends. Okay. So the gables carry a lot of the weight. Okay. Pre-drill and screw system is made much simpler once it's all nailed together because you don't have to be changing the bit out every five seconds. And the reason I'm pre-drilling because it's particle board is, um, have you ever tried to drive a screw through particle board? <laughs> the melamine surface is actually really difficult to work with. So it's nice to uh, have that as an option here. And one more thing I should show you right out of the gate. No, this isn't new for some of you, but the screw has got a shaft with threads that rise above and beneath. You want to find a drill bit that is same size as your shaft, you can see the threads above and beneath it at the same time. That gives you grab. So you're filling the hole that you're drilling with the screw, but the threads are grabbing into the wood. And that is how this works. 
you don't drill it out, all you're going to do is split everything up. Now we're done with that, we'll switch it out. And we're putting in the bit with the T25 head. That goes with the construction screw that we're using. Now there is a drill bit out there that um, will also bore the top of the hole for you. That's more ideal. But this is real life scenario here. And where I went shopping, guys, didn't have it. So I'm just using a little bit of hip pressure to push that in so I don't strip the threads on the screws. There we go. I don't know about anybody else, but I really prefer brad nails and screws over those uh, little plastic dowels and those um, Allen key sets. If you bought this furniture off the shelf at the store, that's what you're doing. You're spending the entire day putting in Allen keys. Oh, here we go. Instead, you can just build it yourself in about the same amount of time. We just got to put the top on. And to do that, now that I've got the solid L, this is a pretty solid piece of furniture. The top of this doesn't add any structural strength to the rest of the box, okay? It's just to create a shelf. So, if I attach it now, I'm creating more weight <laughs> for when I go to hang it and move it around. So, instead of attaching it now, I'm actually going to just leave it alone. <laughs> Because the first thing we want to do is get that French cleat on the wall. Let's go through the science of this, right? Remember our design, 40 inch box, six foot tower. So we'll start in the middle with our six foot tower. That's six feet right here. All right. Now we want it off the ground. So from here to the top is still uh, 72, 18 inches. All right. So if we want to go a foot from the ceiling, we should go to there. Well, here, that leaves a nice space above the same gap as all the other shelving. I think that'll be pleasant and it'll give you extra storage. It also gives me eight inches at the floor. So then the question here then is, how do I make a straight line across this wall from that mark? So let's just measure from the ground up. That is a 78 inch line. Don't mind my pencil marks. This is only primer. One of the reasons I'm using a French cleat is because I'm going to build it, install it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm taking the boxes off so I can paint and finish. And then I can stick them back on when everything's dry. Ha! <laughs> That's going to be amazing. So what I got here is 78 inch line. And this is going to be, I'm going to make it nice and dark. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hang my laser level off of a screw, which is one of the features that this has. You can put a screw in the wall and then mount it right through, right through the back here. My laser line shoots out right there. And I have never really done this yet. I just need to find out how far. It's two inches off the screw hole. Perfect. Thank you, DeWalt, for making something so awesome. So what I want to do is I want to put a screw 80 inches off the subfloor in the door over here. Come check this out. Now over there, I don't have the subfloor down yet. So to get this mark, I'm going to go up here 80 inches and then minus the thickness of my subfloor, which is 5 8 So I'll take 5 8 off here, 79 and 3 8 And if I'm anywhere even remotely close to that same spot on that wall, I'm going to be a happy guy. And let's see what we got here. <laughs> so that represents the top of the cabinet. It's a little bit more than an inch and a quarter. So the first part of the French cleat comes down about an inch and a quarter. And that is here. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to install this line here at that point A. So there's my new measurement. So what I'm going to do is adjust my laser line to be at 74 and a quarter minus my 5 eighths, and then I'll be able to install my French cleat. There we go. Measure once, do everything else twice. Okay. That works. All right, guys, so here we go. This is my original goal, okay? And this line right here, this is gonna work. It's four inches instead of three and a half. When you put a French cleat together on an exterior wall, you never get it to mend perfectly. There's always a little more space because it's really hard to jam it all in and contour with the wall. So this is gonna be fine. My finish is probably right here. And I'm not worried about that. It's just about getting the ballpark. I'm not 
trying to be picky about my spot as much as making sure that I have a laser line. Now, we're gonna take our uh, stud finder, push the button on the wall, find my studs. X marks the spot, right? And there we go. This is the whole process. We're assuming everything here is built 16 inch on center and, and we have that experience based on the, the work we did in the bathroom. All right, well, that's aggressive, but that's fine. And I always aim for the middle. <laughs> you have more chance of success that way. Okay, and I know that there's a, the drywall seam is, I know there's a stud here, and I know there's one there. So what we have is we got two pieces of trim here that's definitely in the way. Oh, all right, now I don't have an oscillating tool. I don't have my fine, I don't have my DeWalt, I don't have anything. So I'm gonna pull the trim off, try not to destroy it. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll cut and reinstall it afterwards so that I can close up the gaps, all right? I actually saved a couple pieces from another part of the demolition because I want to replace where the, this piece as well. I used to have a bracket there, the old closet. And remember, just as a quick note, as a DIYer, um, make sure when you go buy something like screws, you always buy a box much bigger than what you need, okay? Because generally you can get 10 times the number of screws for twice the dollar. And then you'll never have to shop for that screw size ever again. But uh, I was using inch and a quarter to put the cabinet together, and now I've got a two inch to hang it on the wall. I've got a three quarter inch piece of wood, quarter inch drywall makes one, and I wanted to make sure I got at least three quarters in the wood, and uh, this is working out well. The truth is, according to building code, this would be too long, because I'm driving too deep in the wall. But I already know, there's no electrical in this wall, because I know how they built these places. They ran all the power near the floor at one foot off the ground. All of it, the whole, all of it is just all right there. If you don't believe me, check out our bathroom series. That will blow your mind. When we're all said and done, at the end of the day, everything's painted, we can buy little white plastic caps that cover these screws. Okay, we don't have to use filler and paint. Just buy the plastic caps, it makes your life a lot easier. Now each screw carries about 80 pounds of structural load. That is the sheer strength of a screw, all right? So when you're thinking about this, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times eight. Yeah, you do the math. I'm too tired to do the math today and get it right. <laughs> all I know is it's a whole lot more than you need. Now, big surprise, nothing in the corner. And that's why we're using a French cleat because this is not traditional construction. Nobody's framing the back of this. What they do is they build the whole outside, they cover it all. This sheet, this drywall was four feet right on. And then they build the interior wall and then they cover that. It's a different kind of construction technology. So you're not gonna find a piece of wood in every corner when you want one, which is why the French cleat is almost a necessity in this situation. When I was shopping for closets, I took a look at the wire rack system, other prefabs, and they were predetermined designs, and you had to have somewhere to attach this where their structural point was for their product. You can't use that here. You gotta make it custom. If you don't build it custom, you can't have a nice closet. All you're gonna get is a shelf and a rut. So forget about buying all those other kits. Buy some material, build it yourself, save a ton of money, and then you just drop it on the cleat. And then as I'm saying that, I realized, oh my God, Jeff, you built this wrong. Yeah, that's right. The shelf is supposed to be a couple of inches higher. So I got room to attach the other rod underneath. Ha, ha, ha. That's okay. One of the benefits of the French cleat is when you screw up, and you will, let's build this properly. I really should be looking at my designs more often. All right, here we go. If you don't have this tool and you're gonna use brad nails on anything, get it. If it doesn't work by pulling it through, at least it'll cut the head off. Now what I did do in, by doing this is I made the bottom of this look ugly. So what I got is a piece of one by four clamped together to here to create a, 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 like a stop. So my shelf is something to sit against. And I've clamped that together with the shelf. And now I use this square here, this edge, is lined up on the edge of that shelf. So now I know where my shelf is all the way down here. Okay, and this marks it. Now, what I wanna do is, the existing shelf has a hole at this height. So I wanna change the screw location. 
So I know it'll be nice and strong. Okay, same with here. Okay, that's one of the systems you can use. Keep everything lined up. So we aren't gonna be drilling through the other side of that gable. Three, four times. Anything you do when you make it out of wood can be fixed. All right, piece of cake. And now we duplicate that on the other side. Okay, here we are. Now, obviously because of this, we're sticking out. I'm gonna get myself an oscillating tool or knife or something, and we're gonna cut that out before we install it after we paint. But for now, we're gonna leave it alone. Just wanna get that in position. All right, now here's the top shelf, just to give you an idea how this is gonna look when it's finished. We'll get that in there. And generally what we do when we're building closets is we take the brad nailer and we'll throw one or two pins in the corner just so that it's not sliding around and that's it if you're wondering about how this ends up being finished that other one by four that i was talking about goes right here okay we obviously we're going to cut it to size and then when we're finished we'll put a small little thin bead of white silicone after we've got all the primed wood painted now we got the basics we'll build the second box and install that one and then we're going to add the rails for this as well so the next box we're going to build is 24 inch which means we have access to this stud and this stud so one of the things we want to do because it's such a big piece and we don't want to be hanging it just off of the french cleat and that's carrying all the weight so we're going to have the piece of one by three down here across the middle right that's the goal so what we want to do is hang that one by three the height of a finished cabinet. Well, we'll measure from here at 40 inches and up. So I'm gonna measure from the top down to 40 inches and that'll be the bottom of the back brace. So that if you are across the room and you look, you're gonna see a back brace on this piece, on this piece, and this piece, all at the same place. And those back braces are gonna provide a little extra stability and another surface there to screw to to help carry the weight. Now, the beautiful thing about this particular board is it's drilled holes all the way through. So, that hole is in the same size, same space as the other side. All right, there's my 40 right there. Now I can actually tack that right now. Just make sure your face is nice and leave the gaps for the back. Whew, now we can pre-drill and put some screws in this bad boy. You know what's amazing? Is I'm gonna build the entire closet in less than a day and I'm gonna save a thousand bucks, which means if I renovate my house, 200, 200 times a year, 200 days a year, or let's say the average person does it 52 days a year, one day a week, you're going to make, on materials alone, you're going to save $1,000. Be in handy. And then take a look at all the time and money you're going to save. Well, forget about the time. You're, gonna, <laughs> you're not going to have wasted time, but you're going to save a fortune on labor cost just one day a week guys one day a week is all it takes and you can make an extra six figures a year as a homeowner working on your own house developing your own return investment increasing the value of your property increase the quality of your own life while you're living there everybody who owned a house in america worked one day a week on their own property you'd all make an extra $100,000 a year. Now, I'm gonna put the top of this one on right away. Just because, <laughs> I think it makes good sense to have that extra stability right out of the gate on this one. She's coming together. Let's just recap, I've gotta cut the strap, no big deal. I have to actually cut a bunch of shelves. I've got pins to put in that for the shelving. That'll work great. And now I gotta put rods in. Where are the rods? Ooh, out front. 
All right, when you're installing a closet rod, pay attention to your hanger options. If you go too tall, you can't get the hanger up and over, right? This hanger makes it really easy for, for close calls. Like, look at that. What do I need, like an inch from the top? That's awesome, okay? But if you're using old traditional hangers with a bigger hook, you won't be able to get them on, all right? So consider new hangers with new rods. And the reason we're using tape is because it is a measuring system. Check this out. Right up against the edge up here. Okay, hold on. Sets my depth. It's that simple. Now you're going to want to consider your rod with your clothes. You don't want them sticking out too far? You can slide it in. Okay. All right, somewhere comfortable. I like to go back a couple of inches. And this will work really nicely here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to line up my edge right there. That's my hole. Okay. That'll work amazing. That might be even the same thickness. That's even a better idea. We're going to just use the level as our measuring template. That is awesome. Always look for ways to make things easier. There's my mark. Okay. So now I can go over here and line it up on the front. And it's the same spot for my lead screw. Let me just mark and draw. Okay. That seems simple enough, eh? The big screws if I'm going into drywall. Six. Perfect. These are actually to set the rod so that it doesn't slide out. Because this is an adjustable rod, but there's no way to keep it from shrinking and falling out of the hole. Here, check this out. It comes in two pieces. Okay. One fits in the other. And there's another hole there. Okay, so. Oh, it would be nice if that sticker was maybe on the small one. <laughs> Buggers. But you see the hole here? That hole is going to line up with this hardware hole, okay? And so that you can actually throw a screw in it so that when you've got lots of weight on here and you grab something, you don't accidentally pull the rod out of the fastener because it slides, okay? Yeah, so make sure you use the set screws. But then they gave me these three tiny little screws here, which is great, except there's two rods to hang. One on each end. There's two, two brackets. So I need six screws. I don't know what they're thinking. Now I get to go back to Lowe's where I bought this. And you know what, honestly, it was a, it's a cute little system. It gave me lots of flexibility when I got here. Um, just a little bit disappointed is all. Now I don't have enough screws, I've gotta go buy more. I need to pre-drill the hole. Because it is melamine, right? We know this. And I'm gonna need something really tiny. Because those are some really tiny screws. I'm going to go 1 16th. It's almost not pre-drilling at all, except I get past that melamine. And the melamine is really the problem here. Because that screw is not going to go into that. Remember, because I'm taking this back down, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to use a long screw that goes in the next cabin or into the wall. No measuring needed. It goes 36 to 60 inches. Carries 40 pounds at 60 inches. That means it'll carry a lot more than 40 pounds in this environment because it's a lot stronger when it's uh, not stretched out as far. That also means in theory that the rod should bend before it's carrying so much weight that it would fall off the wall because the screws carry more weight than the rod. And so that should help make some of you feel better. We gotta line this hole up. The hole just kind of helps get this started, but still a self-tapping screw I'm using here. There we go. So the cabinet in the corner where the light is, <laughs> we can measure across front and back, okay, to get our absolute measurement. I gotta peel the trims. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this off the wall to install the other cabinet and then install this one again when it's time, all right? So there's no sense going through how we built that. We're just going to build another one of these over there. Let's deal with this one now. Uh, building a shoe rack. Here we go, guys. Shelf clips. Package of 48. Careful when you're shopping. Different stores sell them in different packages. Some of them are just four or eight clips for the same price as 48. Yeah, okay. I did a little bit of comparison shopping with the two big box stores. Wildly surprised how much they're trying to rip you off. A good one is round, goes in the hole, and then it's flat to hold the shelf. 
Okay, and the idea is, yeah, they go in. They're just right for the hole. You want them to go all the way in. Once they're in, if they're not flat, you can just take a pair of pliers and you can straighten that out. And of course, we're cutting our shelves just a little bit shorter than it needs to be. Boom, perfect, right? But here's the thing. When you're making the same box for this side, for your shoes, take your clips from the front and drop them down two more holes. What that does, it creates a presentation box. You can even go to three or four holes if you want to have a really aggressive slope. And then all you do with the back of this, here's the trick. Ready? Grab yourself a piece of this cove molding, okay? It's PVC. And you set it on your shelf. And you can screw it in, glue it in, throw in a couple of nails, whatever you want. And now you've got somewhere for your high heels to hook on and so you can have them sitting up on a display in your, in, your, in your cabinet. That is just a great little trick. And then you take another piece of this on the back side so it grabs where the pins are. And then the shelf doesn't slide off. That's pretty simple. Great little trick there. You know, in situations where you're moving trims, we talked about this before with moving baseboards or casings, but in this case especially, the original wall was actually a painted vinyl cover on the drywall. It's a quarter inch, it's part of the traditional trailer home situation. But because of the extra paint coats, I've got to now cut the paint line for all these trims, or I risk this tearing that happened here, okay? So, we don't want it tearing. We'll take the time, reduce the scope of work, because when you expose brown paper like this, one of the things you've got to do, you've got to peel back all this extra fuzzy stuff. And you can't add drywall compound on that unless you seal it. So you gotta have something like Kills Original, and you have to seal up the brown paper before you go and apply your drywall compound. Or all that moisture is gonna race through into the drywall, the paper's gonna blister underneath your drywall compound, and you're left with a bubble. Every time you add another coat of mud or paint, it'll continue to bubble for the rest of your life. So make sure you seal it with oil before you move forward. And if you haven't picked up a pair of these pliers yet, check out this unique shape, this curved head. The design here is it grabs nails, you pinch gently, and then you can roll on the surface. And it distributes such a huge amount of that weight on a surface that it avoids making dents. So in finished wood, in drywall, anywhere where you've got to remove a nail, this makes sure you're not damaging the surface that you're prying against. Worth its weight in gold, and if you're not sure where to find it, or they don't have it at your hardware store, you can always check out our video description. You can get the link to my favorite tools on Amazon, and you can get a pair of these delivered to you in the next couple of days. Now, because of the way I'm finishing here, I'm gonna be putting in a different trim all the way around these windows. Okay, we're not gonna use this. We're gonna put in some half-inch pine, and then we'll have actual window casings so for me, I just want to make sure all these nails are hammered in nice and flush. Finish prepping your surface before you move forward while your tools are in your hand, okay? Don't go, I'll get that later, it'll drive you nuts. So this is one of these moments where we're gonna use a little attention to detail. This is a, uh, a vinyl inside corner. Okay, but this trim here that connects the end of the eight foot piece with the next piece is on a miter and it's gonna look like crap. So I'm taking this off, replacing it with another piece. And then I'm gonna to have to use probably a piece of shoe molding that goes floor to ceiling. I can buy that in 16 foot lengths. So I'll buy one and cut it so it fits right to the top and then I'll cut that piece in afterwards just before I paint. So now that that's all out of the way, we're at a place in this progression where it's gonna be more consistent with new construction. So let's just get past the green and realize we've got joints of drywall, okay? We've got torn paper that I had to seal with the oil spray. And if you have any torn paper in your job, peel the white paper off and expose the brown and oil seal it first. You'll thank me later. We're using mesh tape today, all right? Partially because, well, Let's just be honest, when you got a mishmash of material, like vinyl and some painted and whatever else, 
You're not going to use regular all-purpose compound on that. It's not going to work. So what we have to do is we upgrade to a compound with a hardener. And whenever you're using a compound with a hardener, you've got the option to expense with the details of using paper tape, go straight to a pre-adhesive fiberglass mesh. Okay, and what this does is it'll bond those uneven surfaces together no matter what kind of condition they're in and it'll give us the ability to create a good solid joint in otherwise not ideal conditions. <laughs> We're just going to apply the tape, use a six inch knife, make sure it has good bonds. It's also our cutting knife so when you're gentle you can hold it against the wall how you cut it nice and simple now in this case I'm also going to break tradition there's a joint here a little crack I'm actually going to use my compound with a hardener and I'm going to fill from edge to edge with the vinyl trim I know this is vinyl vinyl is conducive with hardwood or sorry with with drywall material if it has a hardener we have vinyl trims for doing curves and arches so there's no reason to believe that a painted vinyl wouldn't work well with a drywall compound with a hardener in it. We're blending a lot of science, but we're gonna create just a quick little flat step here in the wall. It's gonna look great, no reason to peel that off, okay? You know, I'm not much for experimenting, but some things, when you have enough life experience, even outside the box, it's not so much an experiment as a combination of wisdom and life experience. Here we go. Now the oil primer takes about 5 to 15 minutes to set up depending on the ambient air temperature and humidity. Uh, this paper tore underneath where that mesh tape is. Okay, just second up. Put in a second layer. Basically you want to go from about a half an inch of drywall paper to mesh as, a, as an overlay. And you keep on doing that until you find another half inch of paper again. And you'll always have a good bond that way. You won't be disappointed. And again, don't worry about the corners. Whenever you're changing material, you always want to use some sort of a some sort of a bead. We're going to use shoe mold in this situation. That'll work out great. So now I've got my wall surface. I'm maintaining that crown at the top, just because it's already integrated with the ceiling and all the way around, and it's all painted. So why mess with that? We're going to do with this surface now and bring it up to speed. Right over here is my issue. So here's my brown paper. I had a huge peel, and I'm going to take my own advice here. And I'm going to mesh, kind of like the whole thing, layer after layer after layer. Give that surface of the wall more than just your mud. Not everybody does this, not everybody has to, but we got the drywall mesh tape out. We're going to be making hot mud. This is the great time to minimize your risk. Instead of getting a 5 or a 10 year, and you get a 20 or a 50 year performance. Take advantage of it. Woo, okay. Here we go, guys. Mixing compound with hardener, 101. I've got regular all-purpose drywall compound here. I bought the, this stuff here, the plus three. This is a lightweight, you know, all-purpose compound, which is different than just an all-purpose compound. Um, it's nice for doing fills on outside corners, heavy details, but it's also nice because it's lightweight. So when I make my texture to spray on the wall, I'm gonna be using this. In the meantime, I'm gonna use this as my base for my compound. I'm adding hardener. Generally speaking, if I'm on a job site and I'm doing a large project, I'll use Easy Sand 90, okay? And just powder and water and that's it. And I'll make my own mud. And it has a pot life of about 90 minutes, an hour and a half. In this case, I'm using the 20. I'm gonna use the base of regular mud, add some 20, and then water to suit because I don't have much to do, right? And a hardener is a hardener, it's a chemical reaction. It just speeds up the hardening regardless of if it's just this or mixed together. So I'm gonna make my life simple because I don't have my big mixing drill here with me. Oh, that's already done. Come on, honey, here we go. Because I'm down here in Florida renovating this trailer and I hardly had any tools, I had to go shopping, right? So I bought a simple Craftsman drill. It was really cheap. Oh yeah, this is, uh, needs water anyway, right? I always said, if you're using mud right out of the bucket, it's not ready to be applied to the wall. <laughs> it's just not. Silky smooth, right? There we go. That's more than plenty. So that'll be our foundation. I got about four scoops. That represents about how much mud I actually need. Okay, I'll use more of this later on in the project. I'm sure of it. It is always nice to have the option to add a hardener to your compound. 
because it allows you to do multiple coats in one day. So I'm just adding about three or four cups here. There, that's plenty. Again, the reason I'm using the hardener, regular drywall compound does not stick to my fiberglass mesh tape. If you don't have the hardener in there, then it'll end up pulling it off the wall. Make one heck of a mess. All right, we're gonna add some water because we're just dealing with a small amount. This chuck drill here is gonna be able to handle the mix just fine. I grabbed a paint mixer and that's gonna work just great. Here we go and the key is on the cord. Make sure when you're using a chuck mixer like this to use the key to tighten the, the chuck to the, your blade. Otherwise, it'll just chew it apart. All right. That is still way too thick. We want it silky smooth. All right, let's have a look. So there's my mud. Now, I'm just gonna take my four by 10, perfect combination, all right? And if you haven't picked one of these up yet, grab a hawk mate. It goes between the handle and your hawk, okay? Locks all your tools in. You can have your four, your six, your 10, your 12. Really speeds things up, especially on smaller projects where you're up and down a ladder or a step or something. And you don't want to have your knife sticking out of your pockets because you get an accident. Here we go. And we're going to set it and then push to the side. If you go like this down the long run, a lot of times the tape will just peel right off the wall with you, okay? So push on and then clean it off. All right. And if I can reach, ah. That's the finish, okay? That's first coat. Don't try to be a hero here. We're simply bedding the tape. We're gonna be identifying where the high and low areas are here. And there's a few of them, my goodness. So I'm gonna put a really good bead right here across the middle because the wall has got a peak. It's acting like a butt joint. Now, all of these joints are actually butt joints. I don't have traditional drywall here, so I'm not filling like I would normally. It's gonna create a lot of extra work, but that's okay. The secret here is gonna be do horizontal lines one day, all right? And then you do your verticals the next day. You can't do both at the same time when you've got intersecting butt joints. Never works. See this? This is gonna be filled in. That'll give it a much more intentional look than having a bump to a smooth section to bump again, okay? I just think it's gonna look nicer, especially once I get the texture on there. Here we go. Don't forget. Not just that, but make sure you get all those spots that you covered up in fiberglass tape as well. Whew. And realize that with a 20 minute compound that's blended 70-30 uh, regular mud, you're still gonna have half an hour to 45 minutes of working time. So don't panic. Be easy on yourself. This coat is not about sexy. This is about bedding the tape. <laughs> and setting yourself up for success afterwards. Second coats, we're gonna fan out about three feet in both directions, okay? And those will be the ones that start to make it look like a smooth wall. And because we're using texture, we're only gonna go with one more coat on this wall, and then we're gonna apply the texture. And that's one of the reasons why I'm using the texture, because this is all cup, covered in butt joints. Traditional mud, to make this smooth and pretty, it would take me probably, Probably a full week. Three coats that go in the verticals and three or four coats going horizontals. Alternating days, that's a lot of work. So by doing this, I'm gonna cut my production time down by about four days. One day to prep, get the first coat. Second day to wide note all my joints. Third day, I'll just get right on to spraying the texture and doing that knockdown. Okay guys, so it's next day, all right? We've got all this dried, we're gonna do second coat now. Um, you're going to see a little bit of the mesh grain poking through, and that's okay. It's not the actual mesh. It should just all be mud, all right? So if you didn't, didn't use enough mud and you still have mesh showing through, that's fine, but you gotta cover it in this coat for sure. And if it's covered, you're in great shape. Now take your six inch, you could use a four inch knife or whatever. We're just going to look for ridges, okay? We're just looking to clean bumps, like right here. See this? 
just cleaning the ridge. Big bumps are our enemy here because we're trying to make things smooth, right? And if we start with a piece of mud that's really thick, then we have to fill the whole wall to that height to make it smooth. Make sense? So do what you can to eliminate ridges before you get started. Okay, that kind of stuff is in your way. Beautiful. Now, I've done a lot of drywall videos. I've taught the entire course how to be a professional drywaller from A to Z. You can check those videos out, but in this one I'm gonna show you the mud right out of the pan. If you're not familiar with it, this is a lightweight pre-mixed drywall compound. Okay, now, when you work it, you tool it we call it, it gets a little creamier. Now, you can spread this, but it's still not very sexy, is it? It's like it, these puck marks. You get rid of them by pulling the mud thinner. Less is more in drywall. See that? A thin coat, you don't get puck marks, all right? That's really good to know as a, as a newbie. If you're new to drywall mud, okay? Less is more because it gives you a smooth finish. A smooth finish doesn't need to be sanded as much. Because all you're doing is just changing the texture of the mud ever so slightly with one or two quick passes. So what we're going to do is demonstrate mud right out of the pail and then I'm going to show you the proper way to work. Okay, I'm using a six inch knife here, one down the middle and one on the side here. Can you see all those bubbles? Okay, see this mud is on really thick and so you see all the bubbles. All right, and this one's a lot thinner but you'll see Real quickly, there's, as, as it's tr starting to try to dry, little bubbles are appearing right on the edge of where the mud and the wallpaper are. The way we solve that is by going really thin. Okay, super thin coat. Now you can actually see that line through there. Okay. And we want to use a little bit of pressure on, on this tip of the knife. There we go. Now that is a proper second coat. But the reason I don't like this mud like this, okay, is because it's a lot of work to press that to get it that thin. Instead, I'm gonna to wanna to use my tool here to speed this up. And this is mud right out of the pail, okay? See how much work and time and effort it takes here to work with this? Now I'm gonna show you the secret that the pros use so we don't have to work so hard and we can work fast. And it's right down here. For every pail of water, you're gonna put in um, about 350 mils. You see that? It's like a small bottle of water, okay? That's how you mix. We're gonna take our drill. I'm gonna take a proper blade for mixing. This is good for drywall compound or thin set. And you're gonna wanna hold on for dear life with your feet on the side of this pail or it's gonna wanna spin around. So you want to start really slow. Now this drill is tricky to work with. It's kind of variable speed, but it's how, how hard you squeeze. I'm going to most likely make a mess of myself here. And you'll also see I got the drill right up against my body so it doesn't start to spin and break my wrist. Ooh, nice and gentle, honey. Here we go. Get that water mixed in a little bit. Okay. There we go. It took off on me, okay. <laughs> what a wild ride. This is not the right drill for this process. But like I mentioned before in the other videos, I'm renovating this whole trailer on a work visa and only brought down a bucket of my favorite hand tools. <laughs> okay, all right. We're gonna call that good enough before I make a mess. <laughs> now, we have silky smooth mud. See the difference? The difference in the texture here. You don't want to have too much on your hawk, but it, it is a little bit runny. Now, I mentioned before it's really difficult to do taping on two different directions, right? So, we're going to start with just our verticals today, and then I'm going to do the horizontals tomorrow off camera. Now this is much easier to work with. I don't have to use as much pressure. And really that's what it is. It's all about the pressure. 
the more pressure you use, the more fatigue, right? So if you want to enjoy this process, you don't want to work too hard. You want to be smart. You want to be artistic. That requires you to you only need a couple fingers. Right down the middle, set your depth, remove the excess, come over here, pressure on that corner. Don't worry about what's going on here. That's part of the horizontal, okay? Just trying to get that vertical relatively smooth. Now, there's a thin ridge of mud right here. And these ridges can be knocked off the next day, all right? So don't worry about it. This is really what it's all about. This is just about getting the verticals. Now, yeah, I did that earlier this morning. It's not quite hard enough for me to mud yet, so we'll have to keep this second coat for later. We'll do that piece at the same time as all the horizontals. Now, this is on pretty thick up here. Wow. Remember, the goal here is to prepare this for texture. One of the reasons we're going with the um, knockdown is because we have the ability to uh, apply it as thin or thick as necessary. So when your walls are in really rough shape, you can put it on a little bit thicker. Wait a little extra time before you work it, and you set the depth of the wall with the spray texture and not with your drywall compound. As long as you have something that's relatively smooth to start with, you'll have something relatively smooth to finish with when you do the knockdown, okay? So this is not about perfection. This is about we're prepping the wall for a spray. So don't get too picky. The less time you spend on this, the better. Just make sure it's thin enough that it's not bubbling. It starts to bubble, run over the bubbles and take a little more material off. I'm gonna suggest you try to wait till the next day, but if you start right where you feathered off, you can come across and then lift where that joint is. This is actually really interesting because this is bubbling a lot more than I expected. And so that's it. You can use the tool this way, or you can roll it in your hand over your knuckles or in front of your knuckles, okay? So that, that's going this way. Roll it back here onto your knuckles to pull it this way. All right, and that gives you really good control. And this is what I'm saying, this area right here. Almost impossible to do this corner perfectly from both angles. There we go. All right, here's a great lesson to learn. You gotta keep dirt out of your mud, <laughs> okay? So we clean the sides of the pail the best we can. Okay, and then we take a damp sponge. Always keep a sponge in your pail with your water and your mixing blade, all right? And you wanna rub the top and the side of the pail. You don't wanna let mud build up on the sides. And the reason for that is it'll dry. And then when you go to scoop fresh mud out, those dry chunks will end up in your brand new mud and you'll be miserable and you'll be upset. You're like, darn it, Jeff, how do you keep your mud clean? Well, this is it. That's the whole secret, okay? Flatten it out a little bit, make sure it's all nice and clean. And then when you're all done, ounce of water on top, okay? There's always gonna be a certain amount of evaporation that takes place. The next day on the job, you can take the lid off, you can grab the mixing blade and mix that all back in, all right? Because it's constantly drying. This is, this is only plastic. There's constantly moisture being pulled out of it. Over time, that's why you always have to mix your own mud. Because depending on how long it's been on the shelf, depending on how thick it is, right? And you don't know until you know. Now, now we have clean mud that's not gonna get full of dirt, okay? It's got a lid on it, it'll keep it sealed up, and it won't go bad, and you can stick it in a corner, and even if you gotta wait a week or two to come back, it'll be perfect condition, and you can just pop the lid and go right at it right away. So always store your mud so that you save it, because it's 20 bucks a bucket, and it takes time and energy to get it to that creamy, smoothie way you like it, so protect it with your life. All right guys, now we're at that point in the project where you get to decide if you're patching is good enough. Now in a lot of cases, if it's brand new drywall work and you're gonna be doing the surface texture, you don't have to worry about it. You're just gonna to wanna to give it a quick sand, use a radio sander on the walls. I like 180 grit, maybe a 220, and a hand sander for little, little details, right? And you wanna use a tool. Now, here's what I'm gonna recommend, just to get rid of these ridges, okay? If you got any bumps, get rid of them. But now I'm looking, because this is an old wall, I'm also looking for I'm gonna do one more coat because everything here 
was a surface kind of like a butt joint, right? So it's nasty. And I'm looking for nail holes now. I'm gonna put dents on them, okay? Because remember, a dent can be filled, a bump has to be feathered. And that takes a lot more work. So if you got any damage on the wall, just make it a dent. Most of the time when a nail goes on a wall, it explodes the product as well, so you have a ridge. So we're just checking for anything like that. It looks pretty good. We're gonna give this quick sand. And for most of what I'm doing here, I just gotta get this detail around this round edge, right? Okay. Make sure that that's perfect. And make sure that I don't have any really thick ridges, that I don't want that to show up. When I go to do a spray texture, a thick ridge will translate in a lot of cases, unless you're using a huge amount of texture. So, let's just take a look at next day. This has actually been a couple days, guys, okay? It was over the over long weekend. You can see there's still a little bit of water sitting on top. Most of it is soaked in, become part of the mud. So now we're going to just scoop that out and put it on our tray here. Yeah, it's a little sloppy, and that's fine. We're gonna work it in, okay? Make it nice and creamy smooth. Silky sexy. Here we are. Ready to work again. Like I said, this is gonna last um, even over the course of like weeks if necessary. Now, this compound does go moldy at some point, all right? So don't take something like this, throw a lid on it, throw it in the back of your shed and go, I'll see you next year, honey. No, just throw it out if you're done. But, <laughs> if you uh, are like me and you're always fixing something, um, it'll last a good few weeks, maybe even a couple months, depending on the conditions. Now, I know, I know this isn't the way I usually do drywall, but there's a unique situation here. Remember, we're on vinyl wallpaper. So, this is what happens. Check this out right here, actually. That's the most obvious example. This is uh, my second coat of quick set. And it's still got two huge bubbles, okay? Okay, it's still got two huge bubbles here. Which is why I took the time to sand the entire surface before I do my third coat. Because of the condition I'm working in, I wanted to remove the surface of any bubble that was covered with mud. Little mini balloons everywhere, okay? Now I can fill those and get a smooth surface so that when I do spray my texture, you know, we're not gonna run into issues. If I do everything first and I come back and I scrape, oh, I'm gonna have pit holes everywhere. Even though you're spraying texture, you're not giving the wall 100% coverage of new mud. You're just adding some texture to the wall and then you're flattening it out because we're gonna do that texture, okay? And so your pits and your heavy ridges, all that is gonna translate through the wall. You'll see it when you paint. So you gotta make sure you got at least a nice smooth surface to work with before you go and spray texture. If you're working with new drywall, that's easier. In this situation, it's a little more work. Everything is dry like a butt joint, like I said. And there's a different relationship with the way the moisture, everything has to dry into the room. That's why we get the air bubbles, all right? You'll have the same effect if you're trying to do a skim coat on a wall that's got a finished painted surface. Because the acrylic in the paint is a bit of a waterproofer. Not uncommon when you're renovating a bathroom, for instance, and you're trying to blend new drywall from your tub surrounding with your old wall. And then you're like, hey, why is the paint bubbling? That's because your bathrooms have acrylic in the paint. That's why it's a bathroom paint, and it's kind of waterproofing. And so what happens is the only way the moisture can escape is into the room, and that's what creates your bubbles. That's why multiple coats and getting it on nice and thin is the solution to that. We're gonna just talk about hawk management real quick. This is what I'm gonna call dirty mud, okay? Because I've got an exposed edge with dirt, and my knife ran up past the edge. I can't be guaranteed that my mud is clean anymore. Man, you'd think I'd be able to get a decent pass here. Wow. That looks like a hell on camera, doesn't it? I'm making sure that I'm separating dirty mud from the clean mud on the hawk now. Okay, dirty mud. I can take it off, just storing it while I work, knowing the difference. I don't want to mix them together. Okay, so now I got it clean knife on the dirty mud side, clean mud to do my fill. The worst thing you can do is a, when you're working with drywall is get dirt in your mud. It just drags a line all the way through the finished surface. There we go. All right, 
Now, I've done this area. This mud's garbage, so I'm gonna go find a garbage can and throw it in. going to sand again. I'm just going to clean up the edges here and then um, get rid of any of these little ridges. That would be the only thing we do. Now we've got to let this dry. I'm going to set up the texture spray machine. We'll show you the tools. We'll show you the secrets. We'll show you the tips and the tricks. It's amazing how many different variations and possibilities you can get with one machine, an air compressor and a, and a mud pump. Here we are guys. Today it's spray day. We are going to be putting in our texture and knocking it down. And I've set this up. We're going to take this one step at a time here because it's kind of crucial. You don't want to experiment while you're doing your room, right? So we're going to walk through. Really, there's four major things that you've got to have some control over. Okay, there's variables, four of them. And here they are. Air pressure, because we're using air tools. There's a trigger on the air tool, and so it's a variable speed trigger. So what we're going to do is we're always going to spray full open. That eliminates that variable, okay? Then you've got your mud. Uh, we're using all-purpose drywall compound. We're going to have to mix it. And so how you mix it will determine the flowability of that compound. And then that'll mix with the air and you'll get a certain spray pattern based on how wet that material is. So we're going to experiment a little bit with that today. That's what the board is set up behind me for. So we're going to set our constant air pressure. We're going to have constant open flow. We're going to get rid of the variability with the mixture of the mud itself. And I suggest if you're going to do this at your house, get an extra sheet of drywall somewhere. Test out your spray pattern a little bit until you're comfortable with it. All right. And then the last variable is how long you're holding the gun in one place. So it's kind of like spray painting. Okay. So as long as you can have a consistent movement, whatever that looks like for you on your test board. Okay. This is the thing. We can get rid of those other variables. We're going to show you by spraying out three different mixes of the mud. Okay. What effect it has on the wall. So this way you can get a whole lot of life experience before you even buy the tools. Speaking of, this is the knockdown knife. This is from Anvil and this was available at the Home Depot. Um, we'll put some links in the video description for you guys if you want to order it in. Here we are. Let me get this out of the box. That's it. That's a knockdown blade. The only purpose of this blade is to knock down texture. It's very thin. It's somewhat flexible. Okay. I can see that. And the idea here is we're going to be passing over mud and it, we want, I don't know how to show this. We want the blade to have some flexibility. So when it meets up the mud, it's, it's, it's knocking it down, but it's not scraping it off. That's what I'm trying to get at. So it's all about pressure. Now they come with these lovely wing nuts and we're going to have to take these off first. It's funny how they always put the wing nuts on these screws. Every other kind of fastener that's out there <laughs> doesn't come like that. We get the washers off there as well. It should go in rather easily. I am not having any success with that. Okay, plan B, when you're losing your mind, we're going to go reverse on the screw holding the nut until I feel it click. Ultimately, that was the problem. This locking nut did not leave enough room on there for this nut. Be careful not to cross thread that sucker, okay? My goodness, that will be a nightmare. All right. Woo! They could have made the screws a little bit longer, Anvil. I mean, you know, another thread or two isn't going to kill anybody, huh? The next tool, of course, is the Husky Pro Hopper gun, again, available at the Home Depot. And, you know, for all the grief that I give Home Depot for their pricing and their, some of their quality issues, I know Husky is actually a pretty decent tool company. And it is awfully convenient to go shopping at a store where you know where everything is, right? So that is what I like to do. I like to go to one store that's convenient where I know where everything is. So I'm not wasting my time running around the aisles. Man, that is really locked up tight for a piece of plastic, huh? By the way, when you go shopping for these, make sure you get one that has never been opened. All right, because there's things in here that we're going to need. Oh, isn't that cute? That keeps you from pouring it all over yourself like I did in my last video. Okay, and here's what we need. The stuff in the bottom of the box. Okay, if you get one that's already been opened, 
chances are somebody bought one, took it home, took out one of these, and, or one of those nozzle tips, okay, and they put it on their existing gun because it got damaged, and then they put it all back in the box and return it. And a lot of people at the Home Depot don't take the time to open the box and understand what was supposed to be in it. So, you know, but if the tape seal is broken, items should not be allowed to be returned. Stop taking things that have been opened, Home Depot. All right, drives me crazy. That's Jeff's rant for the day, huh? So, first thing we gotta take care of is the gun. That's already got a nozzle in there. One second there, let me just make sure. Yeah, that is done. And you can see that when I pull the trigger, it pulls the nozzle back inside that hole. And so you can imagine if inside that hole, here's my nozzle, okay, and it seals up on an O-ring in there. When I pull it back, I get a little bit of flow rate, but if I pull it all the way open, I get a lot of flow rate. And that is why it's a variable that we've got to maintain some control over. And they gave me this to go on this, but they did not give me any Teflon tape. Got to go get the plumbing kit and get some Teflon tape. Here we go, guys. Teflon tape. This is what we use to air seal the joint. You know, in a lot of places and a lot of applications, they put the tape in the box for you, but not here, apparently. Here we go. With the threads. Okay, so you can control that tape. Okay. All right, now, make sure that it's not sitting over the edge. Then we're just going to roll this on. That's the quick connect for the air hose. And careful when you're using a wrench. Okay, this is, this is the part. See the neck? curve on the head here. You want it to be going clockwise. That gives you the, your, your power. If you hold it the other way, the only power you have is in how much you're squeezing these two bars together because this is where it's going to slip off. Okay, so if you want to be strong when you're using a wrench, put the curved neck underneath and go clockwise. That'll make an eight-year-old child strong enough to do this because they don't have to squeeze very hard. That's on really good. Okay guys, so we're going to show you this because these come in the box. There's different size holes for the different kinds of texture work that you might be doing. So this hole is really tiny, and this hole is kind of the middle, the mama bear, and here's the papa bear hole. So you just undo your neck, slides right off, and there's that o-ring I'm talking about, okay? And there we go. This is pushing air, that hole, and this is where your mixture is going to be flowing through. So it fills up the whole area. So when you put this on it, that's closed. Now what that does is that's going to be tight up against the, the metal here, so there's no, no mixture flowing. And as you pull it back, the mud fills up that cone and it, the air pressure sprays it out. So we're going to start off with the monster size hole just because I like to have lots of content coming out. There's no sense putting on a tiny hole and taking all day to do this. So we're going to experiment here a little bit because I don't do knockdown texture for a living. I've done it before, but the guy already had his gun set up. So I'm not sure if this is the right size hole. We'll figure it out together. And you can learn from my mistakes. All right. At least I'm going to be standing here doing all this pressure testing. If it comes out like a big blob of mud right out of the gate, we'll just switch out the nozzle. It won't be a big issue. We're going to keep these handy in case we need them later. There are different guns in the market, okay? Some of them go square like this, and some of them have an elbow. So when you're spraying, your bucket is actually staying upright. You can do that. What we're going to do, we're going to get our gear clamp on here. There we go. We're going to turn this on. We're going to point this away from the handle, okay? So I can have one hand here, one hand up here when I'm working. Now, bring the gear clamp back over. And you'll see the neck here has actually got slots, so you can put this under a fair amount of pressure. When the screw starts getting shavings coming out, <laughs> it's time to stop, all right? Uh, stripping that thread isn't going to do you any good, so there we go. Now we're pretty much set up, all right? Now let's go mix some mud and we'll load it into the bin and we'll give this a good try. All right, so the mud I'm gonna start with is not all-purpose compound right out of the pail. This has been mixed already. So we've been watching the series, uh, made a couple coats and made the last coat thinner. That's what I'm starting with. And it's also been sitting for a week. So just a reference, um, I don't recommend just taking the mud out of the bucket and throwing it in. It's gonna be too thick, it's not gonna flow. Even this, after sitting for a week, doesn't have any flowability. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a little bit of help. Let's see if this has any flowability now. Okay, see how that's moving? That. I don't like that. We're going to go a little thinner, but we're going to do the test with it first. So you see what happens, okay? Oh, yeah, see that's not flowing very well, is it? Here's another one of our variables, and this is the air. Now, right now I'm sitting just shy of 80, okay? 
sorry, just shy of 100. I'm going to be able to read. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, about 92. I'm going to just release this down to 80. So now we have constant pressure. We've got that adjusted. Um, if we find that the flow's too fast and the nozzle's too big, we can always come over here and raise the pressure up so that there's more air coming out which makes the job quicker for you. But what we're gonna find here, I think, is that it's hardly flowing. Now, this has got an air control as well. Remember, that little pinhole, that air is always on when this is open. So you've gotta crank this open and then pull on the handle right away or you're gonna lose all your air pressure. Now, my particular tank should be able to keep me at 80 while I'm working, so it should be not a problem. First try with what we're gonna call the dry mud. Yeah, that didn't flow well enough. So that made a hell of a mess, didn't it? Speaking of a mess, I gotta get in here and clean this out now. Mm. Yeah, that is not gonna work. Okay, let me get cleaned up and we'll try a proper mixture. So we got lots of mud here. Still have a half a pail, but take my sponge here. I'm just gonna add a sponge of water. That's what we're using for flowability. Just enough to like really wet it up, okay? Okay. There we go. Not too fast. I don't want to wear it. Now I got flowability. That's moving around real good. I'm also thinking that my nozzle might need to be changed. Because when the mud was there, it really blew it out. And I'm looking for a little bit more control. I'm going to switch it down to the medium size, okay? Make sure you hold the handle. And you want to swap that out. Make sure the gasket's in place too. It'll pop off sometime. Next test. Get a little bit of this in here. Now, because I still have some of that old mud in the neck, I'm gonna just spray the bottom of this sheet, but then I'm gonna come over here and spray this one. When you do this kind of work, you don't have to wait long before you knock it down, okay? And you don't go like this, you'll scrape it all off. That's knocked down. You see how that finishes off? It flattens all the ridges. If you don't have a nice enough spread, okay, you're gonna get thin and heavy spots. To avoid that, we really wanna have the texture coming out very consistently. Now we've made a couple of changes. We'll try again. I'm gonna spray the bottom first and then I'll do the one in the middle once I get to my mud. Okay, I'm feeling a lot better about this now. Here we go. See how much control you have? That's nice. Okay, so we just sprayed this. Only let sat there for about 10 seconds. Let's try the knockdown. Nope. What happened to my blade? That's this, that's this blade causing that problem. Huh. Well, look at that. That blade isn't straight. Just tightening on those screws has put a warp in it. I'm not happy about that. I guess it's just because this metal here is just a thin aluminum and just the torque of that screw bit has warped it. Well, that's really good to know. Well, if you do end up buying one of these, make sure you put those on, get it started with the screwdriver, but only tighten them by hand. That is crazy. Okay. Well, we're gonna go back and use another tool. One you might already own because if you're at this point, you have a four by 10 hand trowel. Wow, they didn't put their name on the product, just the box. That's just bloody amazing, isn't it? All right, well, this is good. I'm glad I bought this and tried it out. I'm glad I got had so that you won't. Um, anvil, it's synonymous with steel, isn't it? You know, like actually hammering steel and forging. Yeah, so nice, nice plan words. They're, they're so impressed with the quality of their material, they didn't even put their name on the tool. That's a sure sign, isn't it? This is just my opinion, but if you're gonna go shopping and you uh, see Anvil products, you can be sure that if they make this tool, with zero respect for the end user, knowing it's a piece of junk, everything else coming out of their factory with their name on it is probably the same. So begs the question, why in the hell is a company with a good reputation even selling them at all? Because you know what? If you're gonna sell something and it's garbage, makes you think that everything else in the store might be the same quality level. Listen, if you're watching this video and you've done this work before, or you're in the trades and you've got better quality tools, Hit up the comment section and tell people where they can shop and what the brand of the tool is because I can't recommend that. All right, I don't know, big surprise. It was affordable, but now I know it wasn't affordable, it was cheap, there's a difference. A couple minutes now for this to set up. Using my four by 10, gentle pressure is the key here, okay? Just a couple fingers. 
and that's knocked down. You see the difference? The difference is it dries out really quick when you've been supplied with an air tool. Okay, and so by, by setting up this on your sheet, yeah, that's just a mess already. Setting this up on a, on a drywall, you can get an idea of how much texture you like, okay, and how long, how long you want to have it, the density of the texture, all this kind of stuff. And you can make an adjustment. Now we're going to go a little bit thinner for the last spray, okay, and we're going to try to go maybe a little bit more coverage, just a little bit more coverage, just a touch. This is for the purpose of the test. Okay, not planning on using this mud. This is definitely a lot thinner. I'm just mixing it by hand in here for the purpose of a test. Okay, that is super thin. Sweet, here we go. Now listen, I know there's a lot of different textures out there. Nobody uses stipple anymore, but they still sell it in every store, so imagine that. If you, as a DIYer, can make a smooth wall following my drywall videos, or you can do knockdown texture, then you've got all the arsenal you need for your renovations, right? You can have a smooth wall, you can have a textured wall. You don't need to know how to do nine different kinds. So stick with one and you'll be just fine. Here we go. We're gonna do this wall now with even wetter mud. Now we're gonna give that a couple minutes to set up again and then we'll try the trowel and we'll see how that worked out. All right, here we go. This will be a quick check while it's still super wet. And you'll see what happens. Same thing, all right? It ends up wiping off. It's, it's not dry enough yet, all right? So we're gonna give it a couple more minutes. I recommend about a three to five minute window between when you spray it and when you wipe it down. That's all. So you can do it yourself in a room. You can do a wall, right? And you can do an overlap in a corner if you have one. And then you can just put the bucket down, turn off the air, and let the tank fill up a little bit, right? And then go back and knock it down. Not a big deal. You can manage this on your own time just fine because between three and 10 minutes is your working time, in my experience, okay? If you've got a different experience, let me know in the comment section. But if you're gonna make your mud this wet, you've got some working time, okay? If you're in a hurry and you've got a partner, you can go a little drier, and then, you know, 30 seconds to one minute behind you, he can be knocking down the walls. That's great. All right, it's been a couple minutes now. Let's jump in and do this. All right, and just a nice light skim. You'll notice, if you open the blade, okay, you're gonna scrape it off. But if you keep it really closed, you're gonna knock it down and you're not even gonna leave ridges on the wall. Okay, so there you go. Now we have an idea what we're gonna get for a finished product. Now you'll see, this is my spray pattern. You can actually see it. So where the nozzle is, is where most of the material is. Just a thought. We're gonna try spraying not so close to the wall. So I don't force all the material in one little spot. Okay, we're gonna back up a little bit and let it spread out a little bit more. Hopefully we get a little more consistent result because we don't want to have flattened down sections. And then, so this is beautiful. This is too flat for me, okay? So I am gonna stick with this Ted mud, mud texture, the one that's in the pail now. I found that this gave me a better result. When it was too wet, I got too much of a concentration line and this is a better distribution, all right? Um, I'm just moving my, my equipment around, cleaning up so I'm ready to spray. I grabbed this, I wanna just check this out. We've been, we sprayed this about 20 to 25 minutes ago. Okay, look at this. That's pretty darn dry. Wow, it's almost completely dry. Just the heavy spot in the middle. This is, here's a clean hand, okay? Completely dry. That's awesome. That's how fast the mud sets up when it's applied with the air pressure, all right? It's like getting super dried, speed dried while it's getting thrown at the wall. <laughs> Just so you have an idea, all right? So um, if you wait 20 minutes before you do your knockdown, you're in a lot of trouble. You're just gonna have a speckled wall. Supposed to eliminate the need for a third coat and a good sanding, but you also have to remember that when you look, look at that spray, if there are any ridges or lines on that wall, even after you do the knockdown, you're still gonna see that ridge or that line. So you might not need another coat, but just be sure, get rid of any of these ridges like this. Can you see that one? Okay, so that's a ridge you don't wanna see. So we're just gonna nice and light, get rid of it. Piece of cake, right? Quick pass. Make sure that this wall is ready for the spray. Remember, once you spray, the only way to fix something like that is to scrape all the spray off the wall and start over again with two more coats of mud. So this makes sense to be just a little picky right now. Remember, you don't want your friends and family to come over and go, wow, you did that all by yourself. You want them to say, wow, you did that all by yourself? Now you're not gonna be able to see white on white, right? Just use your hand. You know, you'll be able to pick up 
feel any ridges out there. There's a ridge right there. You can't even feel it. See it right now. But you don't want to know, like, under what conditions, how the sun comes up and down, as the earth axis changes around the year. What you don't see today, you might see six months from now. So be picky. So here's my preparation. Um, and it's going to be different for everybody. In a lot of cases, when you're doing texture, you're doing the ceiling and the walls. So you don't really need to tape much off. If you have existing window casements, get the tape and drape like I did in the video for when I was um, painting the outside of this property. All right, you can tape and drape your windows. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use my spray shield from when I paint while I'm putting up the texture. OK, I'm just going to tape off my moldings so that when I'm done spraying, I can peel these off and have a clean line. And I'm just going to tape that ridge right there. That'll give me a really nice look when I'm finished. Hopefully, I'm going to tape this off as well. You'll notice that when we were spraying, we had a pretty consistent situation going on there. The spray didn't go everywhere too badly, but it is a spray system. And so you're going to get texture bouncing all over the place. If you want, you can tape and drape in plastic. I'm going to use a spray shield and I'm also going to use damp rags. So I'm going to spray. I'm going to come back up. I'm going to get my damp rag. I'm going to wipe the ceiling down. We're going to reduce the amount of texture in here. We're just filling to this level. Because what I want to do is be able to do this with one hand because I'm going to be holding the spray shield with the other. OK, because this is wood paneling. I'm not concerned about that as much as I am on the ceiling. OK, now I need three hands. Here we go. OK, we're going to stop there. My arm's sore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let the compressor fill up again. We're going to let this dry out a little bit. I'm going to go up and I'm going to skim that section first. No way I can spray the whole wall in that three to five minute window. And well, actually, maybe there is, but I don't want to work that hard. I have a torn ligament in my thumb, which is why it's always swollen. So I can't really squeeze as well as I used to. I got to get myself a doctor and set up a surgery. It's oh well, life happens, eh? Just knocking down and flattening things out really gentle like. Learning a lot here. This needs to stay clean. A. B. Going left to right is running into problems because uh, the wall, because of this joint, I created a line there. So I'm going to go up and down instead. Yeah, that's going to be less, less damaging. And I was probably a little bit quick out of the gate to get to this too, but I was just dying to see. So where I've flattened it out, I'm going to spray a little more texture. Okay, because they can do a repair on this. That's not an issue. Too aggressive on the weight, that's for sure. Oh yeah, yeah, here we go. It's nicer coming down than it is across. Be conscious to keep the knife clean while we're working. We don't want to let the mud build up on this because it's already half dry. And then you'll end up just dragging it through the rest of the stuff, right? Here we are. Come from the top down. Better. Better, better. Yeah, you really just want to be patient and give that a couple minutes to set up. Now I'm learning my lesson. So areas where the mud hit mud dried much quicker than areas where the mud hit the vinyl. And that stands to make sense, actually, doesn't it? That was almost logically expected. I got one spot up there where the vinyl, that it, it, it made a mess of it. So I'm going to hit that again, and just above the window, I'm going to hit that again too, because the vinyl was there. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot all of the vinyl specifically, and then I'm going to mix and take another batch, and I'm going to shoot the drywall in a few more minutes. So then I can knock it all down together. Just starting to realize that had I skim coated the whole wall, this would not be an issue. So this is where the wet rag run comes in, right? Basically, just wiping the compound off the areas where I don't want to have a textured wall. The faster you get to this, the easier it is. <laughs> but it's just drywall compound. And until there's paint on it, it'll always just wipe right off. So if you miss something, don't panic. Oh, <laughs> just get it later. I want to give that about two more minutes. And then I'm going to spray all the drywall compound areas 
then we're gonna flatten it all down together. Why does it sound like I'm playing basketball in here? <laughs> Time to get the rest of this, and then we finish the knockdown work. You'll notice that uh, when I'm spraying, I'm not going in an S pattern. I noticed that when it's on that drywall, the demonstration, I had an S line. So what I'm doing, I'm doing like oval loops, okay? I'm finding it, the application is going on a lot more consistent that way. Worth giving it a shot. Oh, we're gonna give this three to five minutes. And uh, I'm just gonna pick something inconspicuous. Like over in a corner where there's gonna be window trim. I'm gonna test it out like this, right? Because if that knocks down and doesn't go flat, then it's probably ready. Okay. Well, obviously, letting that sit for just a couple minutes, what a huge difference. Look at that, it knocks down perfectly. Now, you're not gonna have the difficulty I'm having if you're using new drywall and new drywall mud. Because drywall paper will soak this up at the same rate as the mud. All right? But since I'm mixing this up with the vinyl, I'm running into difficulties with the drying time on the vinyl, even though I waited before I shot the rest of this wall. So, I will suffer through that the old fashioned way by trying to be patient. Yeah, it's just not ready yet. Okay. You know, if it's not ready, it's not ready. It's definitely easier to knock down once it's sat for a few minutes. All right. Um, you don't have those same kind of issues with. Uh, with, with the dragging it off, right? You don't have to have such delicate pressure. We're doing a spot over here. That is really nice. Some good control here. And that's exactly the look we're going for. So we've got like two different depths on the wall. And that's what texture is. I love it. All right, so now no matter what lighting I use in the room, once it's painted, you're gonna have little tiny shadows all over the wall to accentuate that texture. It's gonna look really, really good. Okay, because it's half dry, you can move pretty quickly on it. Makes quick work of this. All right, now we're just gonna wait till the vinyl is dry enough to knock it down. <laughs> <laughs> Might be another 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, so I'm gonna go finish this off camera and we're just gonna jump right into the painting. We're gonna do some priming painting and show you the difference in the technique. Okay, I'm just missed one of my plugs and this is my cheat. I'm using kills. Okay. You can wipe down your old plugs and spray them with kills and turn them white so they look new. That's how you go from 1985 to 2023. All right, here we go. Next thing I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna recommend this, regardless of the condition of your walls. People ask me, what if I got textured walls? Do you sand? Yep, get yourself a nine inch orbital sander like this. All right, and we're not scrubbing the wall. We're simply um, removing any debris or bumps or lint that was there previously, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm setting this on the wall and just like a, a light gravity scenario. Remember, this drywall hasn't been primed yet. So it's really soft and sands easily. And because of the vinyl, the nature of it, it didn't spray on and knock down as well as I wanted it to. So I'm just gonna take some ridges off, give that a much softer look. There, I like that, all right? Whenever you're painting, you always sand in between coats because there's always lint fibers that get stuck on the wall. And you're gonna see them somewhere down the road. So make sure you got one of these. Always paint, sand, paint, sand. Here's an important rule, okay? Whenever you're working with new drywall compound, it needs to be primed. It needs to be primed because it needs to be sealed. And for that, we use a PVA drywall primer paint. Don't use any of the other paints in the store that say they're primers because we're priming for new drywall and that's specific technology in a specific can. If you get the wrong primer, you're gonna have major problems with your, with your work. For all the grief that I give the Home Depot and the Bear people, this is the best paint the Bear makes. <laughs> I love this stuff. And it's in an orange can, so it's really easy to find when you go to the store. And it says drywall primer and sealer, okay? Very important you use this right product here. Okay guys, if you don't 
have the right tools for opening a can, you can always use a e knife. That's not a problem. And if you're wondering, yes, we're gonna have a link of all of our tools in the video description, okay? So you can go and get all of those. I love to use these jumbo trays. And unfortunately, not everything that the Home Depot sells is in every Home Depot store all the time. So sometimes you gotta order online and sometimes you just gotta go to a regular paint store to get your gear. I love to go shop on Amazon because I always get it the next day. <laughs> when you prime, you put them in the, in the paint and you roll it back to get it on the, co on the cover. If you try rolling forward, it's, the weight on, on the paint is gonna spin the, the roller back down every time. All right, so s grab it and then walk it up. There we go. And now you got some paint in there. You'll work it into the roller. Run it 15 or 20 times, okay? You really want to condition your, your nap roller here to be full of paint before you get started. All right, there we go. I know when you're painting, a lot of people, they do cut and roll, which is brush. When you're priming, you always start with a roller, and then you only have to brush what's left that never got touched. Okay? Makes life simple. Remember, this is brand new texture, so you don't want to be rubbing into the corners and removing it off of another surface. And after you get a few passes in, you'll find that the roller will hold a lot more paint. Okay, and you gotta use some pressure here. Force that paint into the texture. If it's not sealed, it's gonna be really interesting when you go apply paint. You'll end up getting your wall color soaking up into that drywall, because it's not sealed. And then you'll end up using a lot more paint product on your first coat than you want to. And you might end up in one of those situations where you gotta go back to the store and buy another can Drywall primer is usually around $13, $15 a gallon. It's not expensive. And a good paint for an interior finish will run you usually between 40 and 100, depending on what kind of performance you're looking to get out of it. And we'll talk about the paint that we're using in this video in a few minutes. So once you've got your roller working really well, you should be able to go floor to ceiling one roller wide of paint. So what we do is we go up and down. We're always using a little bit of pressure. The pressure follows the cage, enters here, so it's stronger here and weak on this side. So once you've pushed your paint into the wall, you can back up, I'll exaggerate it, okay? And then light pressure, roll over the surface again. This will get rid of any drips that are sitting on that wall. Really hard to see when you're dealing with texture. It's one of the reasons why you want to use a three quarter inch nap or if you're in Canada, we'll call it a 15 or 20 millimeter, okay? You wanna have this thick enough that it holds enough paint to get the job done and push it into that texture. If you use a thin nap roller, you're not pushing anything into the texture. You're only gonna paint the surface and that won't seal. Remember, the thicker the texture, the thicker the roller. Now, if you're wondering what's my plan for Fixing the windows. I'm going to removing the blinds, getting this old paneling out of the way, and then I'm going to use a uh, uh, some three-quarter stock, some wood. We're going to frame up a window jam and then put window casings on. We're not going back with the traditional mobile home plastic outside corners. We're making this house look like our traditional builder's home, not a mobile home. Whoever buys this place has no intention of leaving. It's a beautiful gated community with a golf course, beautiful clubhouse and facilities. And so this, when I sell this house, is gonna be somebody's retirement home. And that's why I'm trying to make it as beautiful as possible. Now, because this is just primer, I'm not too concerned about my cut. This piece of molding here has only been primed and I'm gonna hit it with um, some semi-gloss just so it looks more like a crown molding when I'm finished. Okay, so I'm fine with really pushing that paint into the corner and going all over the trim. All right. Remember the rule for painting is to paint from inside the brush, even when you're doing primer. So have about one inch of paint in the can. If you have more than that, just tilt the can on the side and then push it in at the top, the thin part of the can, okay? Load that brush up. It'll carry a lot of paint in it and it makes this a lot easier. Now you can set it on the wall and then push it into the surface. 
collect all your drips. Now, because you're painting texture with a brush, you're going to have to come at it from a couple different directions, and you're going to want to have lots of paint on here. It is a lot easier to start with too much paint, and then when you get the paint out of the brush, you can go back over your work and just pick up all the extra drips. All right, remember, this is drywall, and if you use too much passing back and forth, you're actually going to melt and smooth out the texture. <laughs> So try to do this as quick as possible with as little work as possible. All right, that's it for the priming. Now we're going to give this about 20 minutes to dry out. And then we're going to come back for the next step of the preparation because we're still not ready to paint yet. All right, now here's a great opportunity to be cheap. Because it's primer and we always sand after our primer coat, it's okay if there's a little bit of dirt or fuzz or whatever. So set your cage on the edge of the can. All right, take your 5-in-1 tool and simply... Clean out all the extra paint. Ooh, that's a really thick roller. And it might not seem like you're getting a lot done here, but the truth is, these rollers are uh, about $9 each right now, if you're buying a good microfiber. And if I can get six or seven ounces of paint out of here before I go to wash this, that's money in the bank. It makes the cleaning up process a lot faster, and it saves your paint. Now, same regard, the paint that's in the tray is still good. Here we go. Okay, simply use your brush, get all that extra paint out of your, your tray. Between the brush and brushing out the tray, it's almost a full quart. And that's just unnecessary to throw in the garbage. Now, if this is your wall paint, you can't do that unfortunately, because your wall paint has to stay clean. You don't want to get any wall paint dirt back in the can because your final coat doesn't get sanded when you're done. There we go. Now we're good to go and wash that gear while this is drying. So the primer is done, it's dry, and it took a while. Remember, in behind this is a vinyl drywall. So it was about an hour and a half and I had fans on. <laughs> Gotta love that. Uh, it's time to sand now because when we paint, we paint, we sand, we paint, we sand. That's the way it works. This is a nine inch abrasive disc I got from my hide sanding pole. And the idea here is set it on nice and gentle, okay? We're not looking to sand anything down. We're just looking to rub dirt off if it's on there. All right. Remember, that's just to get rid of that, right? There's just a few little dots on there that were raised edges that we want to get rid of and make sure everything's continuously perfect. That's it, all right? But it's worth it, especially on flat walls, but even on textured walls. Now, a lot of you will know, uh, if you're a fan of the channel, that I use this 25-year paintable latex caulking. It's got some stretchability in it, and it works out great. And it's not a runny, gooey mess, all right? It's got a bit of stiffness to it, which is nice to work with. But in this case, I'm using this. This is a 20-minute quick-dry caulking, okay? This is two hours. And since I'm only doing an accent wall, I don't want to wait another two hours before I do my first coat of paint. So I'm going to show you my trick right now for how you do an accent wall and have a straight line from one textured wall to another textured wall. Because that is a common question that I get asked so let me just show you the secret in the sauce is this. So you can see here, because we've got these raised dots of texture in and on and around, there's no way to draw a straight line. So what you have to do is you have to create one. And you just take your caulking, all right? And this is, I understand this isn't exactly um, like the inside corner of one wall to the next, but it demonstrates the situation. And you wanna use your finger to press it in to create a smooth concave surface, okay? Now that you've got this smooth concave in the side of the corner, you can draw a straight line on that with your brush coming from both directions. All right, and the only other thing you need to know, if you're gonna be doing an accent well with texture, always do the uh, light color first and the dark color last. All right, so if your accent well is dark, paint the whole room first and then do the accent. This is also an effective technique if you're painting and whoever sanded the walls over sanded in the corners and made a big groove. Have you ever seen that? Up at the ceilings especially, you can see that where the, 
the ceiling white, and then the wall color, and there's this groove in there, and it's a dark line because it's creating a shadow. Now, you can get rid of that just by using a little bit of quick dry caulking. And if in 20 minutes this is dry, that means you can go ahead, do some caulking, hit all of your corners, okay? You can pull out your color, your brush, and you start doing all the cutting in for the first coat around your doors, windows, plugs, switches, all that kind of stuff. By the time you've done that in the room, you can then get up on your ladder and you can hit that ceiling edge and it'll be ready to go and perfect every time. All right, guys, let's just go through this. Uh, my Brig, if you're not familiar or you're new to the channel, I use the Wooster Sherlock system. This is a painting stick that has positive holes and tabs locks in position it doesn't unravel on you it also locks onto your cage okay bam so when you're painting your handle's not untwisting from that little screw that everybody else uses so that's why i love this the cage has also got great compression it's on ball bearings and gives you really smooth action like i said we're using texture so another three quarter nap roller boom and then lock that in Boom, now I'm ready to go, okay? Um, I like to use a three inch angle brush. This is my favorite brush. And because I'm down here in Florida and I wanted to just do a quick little shout out about this situation. There's my accent color, ha <laughs> ha, it's gorgeous. We're going for a beachy look. This is a Sherwin-Williams Super Paint available at the Sherwin-Williams store. And because I'm down here on a work visa, I set up a commercial account. And so basically that's name, phone number, address, and that's it, okay? <laughs> I get to buy all my paint with a cash account and get special pricing on my favorite paints. So Sherwin-Williams has about seven different lines, quality lines, and they have different performances, okay? Um, and contrarily, a lot of you guys go to Home Depot and they have four. Bear has four different wall paints. So their wall paints go from $34 to $65. And Sherwin-Williams is, uh, this one's in the middle. This is the middle line, and it's a good quality paint, right? Like I'm not running a daycare here. I don't need it bulletproof. It's just for my house, and it's in a bedroom. Uh, this one was $38, just to give you an idea. So you think you're going shopping at Home Depot to get the cheapest paint in the market? You're probably correct, but it's not the best value because this is not comparable to the cheap gallon that you can get at Home Depot. This is comparable much closer to the top line. All right, there we go. So that's what I do. I load my roller up. Um, we're gonna cut and roll. I'm gonna cut first just because uh, I'm looking forward to getting on the brush. I'm gonna put a little bit more paint in here, empty out my can. All right, and boom. Now that this is sealed, I don't have to be so concerned about melting the mud, like when I was priming, right? So I'm gonna, again, same thing. I'm gonna push the paint into the brush. Just clean off the outside of it, okay? And I paint from inside. And here, I wanna be somewhat careful. Draw a straight line on that ceiling. Now, look at this. That's the texture up against that wood. Okay, you see? Very difficult to get a light, nice line in it. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is before I do my second coat, I'm gonna come back with my caulking and I'm gonna run a very thin bead there to get a straight line. Just like I did in my demonstration. So that I can move on to having a nice finish. There we go. But for now, now that I'm committed here, and this vinyl is gonna take about another hour and a half to dry, <laughs> there's no way I'm gonna stop and wait for that to dry and put caulking on. So I'll get the first coat. One of the benefits of using a caulking um, is that it only requires one coat of paint to cover. Okay, so if you find you make mistakes after you're, you're done your first coat, you can use caulking to fix it. Like let's say you find this tiny little hole, you can grab your five-in-one tool, put a little caulking, and then flatten it out with your with your five-in-one, and that's as good a repair as anything else. 
And that'll save your bacon in the middle of a paint job. All right. There we go. Oh, 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 I'm making a hell of a mess up here. Yep, yeah, I definitely should have taken the time of caulking all the way around the edges first. Oh, you know, I'm a flat ceiling kind of guy. Just not used to this. I should have put that in as part of my process. All right. Okay, and if you've got little white holes, don't be afraid to dab. Really, the goal here is to make sure that everything gets painted, not just the surface. <laughs> I know, I, I managed to save this drywall and uh, I'm regretting it now. <laughs> this is just drying so slow. Oh, if I ever am in a situation like this again, I'm pulling that old quarter inch drywall off, throwing it in the garbage and I'm starting over with something real. This is just creating so much extra work. It's kind of like, you know, over in, in, um, in Europe, the paint cans, they tell you the recommended drying time on paint is two hours. It's because so much of the country over there is old material and it's plaster and masonry and everything else. And those products do take about two hours to dry because it can only dry into the air in the room. Or down here, when you use drywall, man, your paint usually dries in about 20 or 30 minutes. But not today, not on vinyl. There we go. Now, I don't have to make this perfect in the corner because I am going to be adding trims, okay? But I want to paint this first and add the trim second. And that usually is a little bit out of order for me because I don't usually uh, paint anything until the trims are there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-paint all of my trims and then put it on with a siliconized caulk that comes pre-super white. That way I can do it all the wall, come back, do all my trims, all my windows, caulk the gap, and then use a wet rag right on the dry paint to get my finished edge. And that is going to look amazing. Okay. <laughs> you know, here's something interesting. Some of you might be going, hey, what is this box down here? <laughs> this is back in the day, we used to have landline telephones. I can still buy a cover plate for that, which is why I'm not taking it off. It is nice to have an old phone that doesn't require any power to operate because Bell Telephone has its own low voltage cable. Bell Telephone. Well, I guess depending where you live, eh? But uh, telephones have low voltage cable. And the telephones, even when the power goes out, still work. If you have an old phone that only works on that low voltage only. So, nice to have one in every house, just in case of emergency. And if you're watching this at home and you're like, hey, I like that color, uh, check out the video description, guys. I'll have my wife, Michelle, put that information in there for you. She picked it, I just painted it. <laughs> uh, makes my life simple, eh? When you paint, always cut around your plugs and switches. So you don't paint the plugs and switches. I always take the covers off too, my goodness. So here's my caulking line. I'm just gonna demonstrate what it would be like to cut. You come up a little bit short, right? Get the extra paint out of your brush. And then you can draw a line on that caulking. Okay, and that's about as close as you're gonna get. And that's okay, because that camera is right up nice and tight. Let's get the shot from a distance. There we go. That looks pretty darn good to me. There you go. Well, that's how you would paint two different colors because now I got white and whatever this is. Oh, debonair. What a fancy word. Okay, here we go. Oh, here we go. This is my rig. Here's my roller. And like I teach, start in the middle of the paint, roll it towards you to get it onto the roller sleeve. Watch what happens when I lift it. The weight pushes it back down again. Now, now you can set it here and roll it forward into the paint. 
and you don't have to fight with it. You don't have to sit here going crazy, all right? That's all it is. Start in the paint, roll it towards you, lift it up, let it sag, drop it, and push it back in. And then, now we're just forcing lots and lots and lots and lots of paint into that roller sleeve so that we can get on with our day here. All right. All right. Now, good paint doesn't drip. You see that? That's good paint. <laughs> That's how you can tell. The paint you're using is making a mess. You're not using a good paint. And we're using a little bit of force to help that three-quarter knot work its way into all those holes. Okay? Don't be too concerned if you get a couple of pinholes and they're missed on the first coat. You can get that all on the second coat. You're going to be just fine. And listen, if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, this is awesome, I'm learning something, give this video a thumbs up, okay? YouTube loves to get that kind of interaction with you, the audience, to, so that we have an idea of what kind of videos you like to watch. And then it helps us with our programming. And it helps us get our message out, too. And the message is simple. Anybody who owns a house can fix their own house up without having to pay for contractors. Okay? And if you're not sure how to do it, we got videos on every subject matter to help you get there. All right? That's the goal of this channel. There's just not enough people in the world anymore to provide reasonable services at a reasonable cost with decent quality. So the average homeowner is going to get left in a lurch hiring unqualified staff. Might as well just learn how to do it yourself. Gain your independence. And then that 400% value on your material costs that you put into a project that becomes your money and your bank. Because every time you spend a thousand bucks renovating your house, you make $4,000 of equity. And that is money in the bank. So here, let me tell you a little story about how we picked this color. Okay? <laughs> because there's a little design tip here. When you're working with paint, you've got hundreds of options of a color that's close to this. All right? And you got what's on the fan deck, but there's also all kinds of different variations for every color in the fan deck. They don't show you every color in the fan deck. There's not every color on the wall that they can make at the paint store. There's thousands of colors. And every year they put together a different suggestion for the colors of the year based on uh, what the market is selling. What's the colors of towels and what are the carpet colors and carpets and flooring and the whole industry's got this whole color scheme working behind the behind the scenes, all right? So, what you do when you're going to pick a color, is you can have a first preliminary idea, but then you've got to get the most important thing in your room, and that is your flooring. Because the flooring will determine whether you go more green or more gray or more blue or whatever. Check this out. Here's my flooring. Boom. Okay? And we're going to do the video on how to install this. This is a nice 5 mil vinyl plank with a 1 mil underpad. Very rare, okay? Good quality comes from Europe. We're going to be doing this installation in this room in another video real soon. So if you want to learn how to install vinyl flooring properly, not just slap it in there, because it's very important to make sure all of your joints are locked properly. If you want to learn how to do that, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on the notifications. This video is coming soon. The easiest way to increase the value of your home. One of the lowest cost professions out there as far as the barrier to entry as far as tools are concerned. And one of the most relaxing processes. You know, a lot of people don't enjoy painting because for years they've been buying marketing and buying cheap paint. It makes a mess, it's dripping everywhere. <laughs> if you buy decent paint, you don't even get any on you. And you're noticing that I'm only going about one width of the roller here, and that's because it takes a lot of paint to fill up texture. All right? If I try to go too much, I have to really squeeze to get that in there. And that's just 
that's just a lot of work that's not necessary. By the way, when we're done this, we will be sanding again. Here, I've got lint and lint. Boom. And I want them gone. I don't want that part of my finished look. It's going to happen. Now you can always do what the pro suggests and you can tape your roller sleeve and you can get rid of a little extra lint before you get going. But I've done that before in the past and you know what I find out? Yeah, you might get a couple of pieces of lint off, but then when you're painting the room, you're still getting new pieces of lint coming off. So it's not a solution to the problem. Nothing is going to make it so that you don't have to sand. Sanding is a guarantee in the process. So don't waste your time taping your roller sleeve. <sighs> it's just one more thing that's gonna take time and money and it isn't gonna change the way that your production works. Now, just because I don't want to have to have you spend all day long watching me painting a wall, I'm going to just say this. I'm going to be trimming out these windows all over the whole building. And so we're going to do a video dedicated specifically to that on the other side of the building, um, in the front bay windows, where we changed all the windows out. If you didn't see that, the video link will be in the description, but we don't want to film this way because of the sun's back there and it's just really hard to film. So we're going to trim these out, get this room all finished. All right guys, so look at this. We got this ridge right here. Starts about here. Visually I can see it, it just like right here. I don't know, what the heck. I think, because I, if I remember correctly, um, when I installed this piece of plywood in that subfloor video, this is actually the same piece and I cut down the middle so I could drop it in in both directions. And I think this is just an extra layer of lamination. Uh, it happens. When I was really young, I worked in a cardboard factory and I remember they'd have multiple layers of product going through all the rollers and it would feed together. And then every once in a while, the roll would run out and they'd have to put a new feed line in. And that's all plywood is, right? And so sometimes you get an extra layer and so a set of five eighths goes to three quarters thick there. And then sometimes it goes down to half inch. Um, my job was to run out on the belt and grab all the pieces that were all screwed up. I don't think they do that with plywood. <laughs> anyway, what I did is I set the depth of my saw just a hair, like about maybe, maybe an eighth, eighth of an inch deep, maybe a sixteenth. All right, we're gonna do a lot of this grinding with the skill saw here, just to get the majority of the cutting out of the way. Before we can do this, I gotta pull out some screws. Let's find out where they are here. That one's missing altogether. Okay. Not sure why that screw was so long. We're just gonna go like this. Um, I'm gonna position myself so you can see my style here. you really want to design for speed, right? I could just sand it for an hour and a half, but... And it's not about being perfect. Remember, the rule when you're working with this is holes that are like an inch or smaller, the flooring is going to translate over that, no problem. There we go. No more bump. Piece of cake. Now, yes, that's messy, yes, it's ugly, but it'll do the job. And I'm not gonna spend two hours of my time with the sanding disc doing that. All right, that is money in the bank. If you're wondering, I'm trying to hammer everywhere there's a joint on the second row and on the first row, just to make sure it's all locked nice and tight. And if it isn't sitting flat, Snap it back into that joint again. Yeah, that's not working out. I'm just gonna damage it if I have to hit it that hard. There we go. Uh, no sense moving forward until what you've done is perfect, okay? All right, now let's take a look at this problem area. My spot. 
I get stuck, right? It's not as thick. To demonstrate that, like, like my, my blade is coming underneath that, okay? Right over to about here. So that's where it stops, just after the screw, okay? So I've got a significant gap here to fill. And it goes all the way down here. If you check this out, this whole area has got some pretty good d lamb. So what I'm going to do is try to fill in this area where they missed <laughs> that layer of plywood on this sheet. It was so nice of them to do that. Now they sell Henry's um, at the Home Depot. Okay. Uh, and it kind of looks like wet sand right out of the bucket. And this ain't about getting pretty. This is about getting in the filler. You can only fill an eighth to a quarter inch tops anyway. You read the instructions. If you have a bigger gap than that, then uh, you have to do two applications. Like anything, if you put it on too thick, it's going to shrink, right? So let's try to establish. Yeah, that's where that meets. And we're just going to try to feather it in. Remember that the flooring itself has the ability to adjust to, to minor grading differences. So, you know, you don't want to turn this into an engineering project. We're just going to feather that in. There we go. I'm going to be perfectly fine with that. Make sure I don't have any ridges. Okay, beautiful. Now, we're gonna see uh, how long this stuff takes to dry. Expose the air. I'm thinking probably 30 minutes to 45 minutes. What I'll do is I'll get the next few rows in. Keep ourselves busy while we're waiting for this to dry. Every off cut you get is the start of another row, unless it's really small and stupid looking. Of course, you know, if you're on a budget and you're trying to use every scrap you can, Having a small piece against this wall is not going to be a problem. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It just, visually, it's not as attractive as a longer piece of wood. That's all. One of the things about flooring that you want to make sure of is what we call aging. You don't want to have the lines where the joints are consecutively or close together, okay? The rule of thumb is the width of the board, no two joints should be together within the width of that board. Now, this one's a little close, but it's not next to it. You see this? A four foot board, seven inch wide, from this corner to this corner, there should be more than the width of that board there, okay? Visually, that's more appealing. When they start getting too close together, it looks like it's intentional, and then they're gonna, the brain will focus on it and go, wait a minute, you didn't line it up properly. It looks like garbage. As long as it's nicely scattered, it looks intentional, and everybody is not going to notice if there's a pattern or lack thereof or judge it for whatever reason. Here we go, you see this? Now I'm at this place where I've got like a four inch piece. That's because I started with a short piece and it's causing me an issue. And personally, I don't care. I kind of like the look of having the occasional piece up at the end. A lot of people give me heck in the comments, but at the end of the day, this is where the bed's going. So, consider that when you're making your plans, because the last thing I want to do is tear a row of flooring up just because there's a four inch piece. And there's nothing structurally wrong with it. Aesthetically, it may not be as pleasing, but no one's going to see that once the furniture goes in. So I'm not going to waste my time. At the end of the day, a good chunk of DIY is about your speed. Okay, <clears throat> don't let dirt sit in those grooves. As you can see, when you get into rhythm, this project goes pretty quick. Nothing like a good pair of knee pads to make this speedy either. There we go. Uh, been a couple hours. It's not perfectly hard yet, but it is dry. It's, uh, you know, it's a little malleable, but we're putting on flooring, so that's not gonna be a problem, okay? Uh, that took about an hour and a half, just to give you an idea. Okay, and anything that's small and in the neighborhood, like this little chunk here. 
Okay, you see how I got to chisel this off now? Yeah. Give you an idea of the strength of this product. Now, this is going to finish curing. Oh. Okay, we'll just scratch off the ridges. Um, this is really weird science. This stuff is going to finish curing, and it's okay if it's like this. Remember, this is providing us a substrate of, of, of strength. It's a buildup so we don't have a gap, so we don't have the, the split. I'm going to install this. We're going to be extra careful. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to go right over top of it. It can finish curing after the fact. Okay, it's not going to be the end of the world, but it's going to allow me to move on with my project. If you want to give it overnight, go right ahead. But in the trades, when we're getting paid by the square foot, we don't worry about things like um, dry and cured. We get it done. So for me, this is just good enough. I can move forward with this knowing that it's going to finish curing overnight. And once I put product on there, it's not going to get any more dense. Okay? Like, check this out. Here's a little bit extra. This was really thin when it was applied. Right, really what I want to do is just make sure I don't have any ridges. Right. The fact that I could get a tool underneath there doesn't mean anything. It's still going to be plenty strong enough to support the weight of the floor down the road. And really, that's all we need. Whoo, what do we got? We got a joint here, a joint here. Makes sense to start with a short one this time. Okay, here we are. Now remember, one of the cardinal rules of what we're doing here is trying to stay in line with our warranties. You don't want to follow the warranty because you're expecting to get money back for the problem. You want to follow the warranty because those are the guidelines for a proper installation. And they represent the weaknesses and strengths of the product. I have yet to meet anybody at a dinner party who worked at the warranty department of a flooring company. <laughs> and if you've got that job and you're watching this video, I would love to hear from you. How many people actually get a uh, warranty on their floor for improper installation? I don't think there's one in 10 million. Remember, the CPBC finish on this flooring is never the problem. It's always the installer. You know, there's one thing I don't think I've ever mentioned. Why would you use vinyl? Like, what are the best moments for this application? Because I teach people, hardwood and tile are your two favorites, okay? Those are your best options for flooring. But, you know, seldom do I ever mention that there are two occasions where you really want to prefer this product over a hardwood or a tile. And that is, one, in a basement, because it's better to have a subfloor system with a vinyl plank than it is a subfloor system with a tile. Hard to get a subfloor system that has uh, enough strength and enough decoupling membrane with a tile that's, that's affordable, right? This you can put right on concrete. If you want to put a subfloor down, you can get insole armor from Drycore. This goes right over top of that. So you get a thermal break, you get the air movement. The other situation is if you are a big pet lover. So if you've got dogs and they're rambunctious, let's call it, the, the PVC finish on this flooring is probably about 10 times stronger than any polyurethane that you can get on a hardwood floor. So if you've had hardwood floors in the past and the dog scratched it up, consider going to something like this because this is a lot more pet friendly. A, it just won't scratch up. It won't build up under the claws. They're not going to ingest it, okay? So this is better for the dog. It's better for your house. And that's one of the reasons why people love this. Outside of that, there really is no reason to go to vinyl other than the ease of installation. As you can see, yeah, you can install hardwood relatively easily, but you gotta have a lot more tools. This requires basically a knife and a jigsaw, a $30 jigsaw and a utility knife. You can install this product just about anywhere. So that's really the other major, major benefit. When we install hardwood as a DIYer, we generally using a table saw and a skill saw and a nailer, compressor, you're renting tools. But professional hardwood installers, they've got other tools as well. They have tools that create the tongue and the groove on the hardwood, okay? So that they can get a perfect locking system on all kinds of transitions. The DIYers, we just don't have access to that and you can't rent it from Home Depot. So, 
Uh, you can get close to professional, but you can't get as good as a professional. With this, you can install it as good as anybody else on the block. So, consider that. <laughs> now there's one more spot on the floor that I want to show in this video, because this is a huge 1,350 square foot installation with no transitions, right? But what about up at the dishwasher, <laughs> around the kitchen appliances? I get these questions a lot, right? Do I install up to the machine or under the machine? Do I have to pull it all out? And the answer is coming up in just a few minutes because we're going to go finish off the kitchen and I'll show you. Okay, the tap does not, the way you lock it, the tap is to guarantee it's locked. You should make sure your, gate, your lock is engaged fully before you tap it for best results, all right? So here we are, we got a unique corner. We're gonna just take a minute to show you this, all right? First of all, the inside corner trim I'm gonna remove. We're gonna be putting in baseboard, so we'll trim that proper height later, but for now, Let's just talk about this because we have multiple wires, multiple holes. These two are actually attached. And so the largest drill bit I have is big enough to go over the, the top of the wire here, okay? I gotta get a wrench. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna disengage that one. There we go. Just need to give it a little bit of love. <clears throat> okay, Whew. That's step one. Step two, we're gonna wanna bring this plank right up to these wires, okay, where they come out of the ground, all right, and we want to then measure and cut this piece, because I don't want to have to drill a hole big enough for those two, all right, so we're going to measure and cut, there we go, now, that's my flooring. Now I can do a notch in this side of the floor for these wires, okay, on the table saw. And I can draw a line where that comes through the floor, okay? And then I can drill a hole right here. That's simple enough, eh? Now, all of my difficulty is on this really small piece. And the joint allows me to only notch one side and keep everything as clean and tight as we can. My experience with drilling holes is that once you penetrate the, um, the front core, that's, that PVC, it drills really fast. So what I like to do is take these lines and put this line just to the right side of the handle and this line just to the underside of this. And then I can drill right here and have myself a little bit of a built-in braking system. Now pay attention, all of that white is the wear layer, okay? That's extremely durable. Whoa, hey, probably better to do that over your plywood, but hey, let's get this through here. And of course, this is all dry erase marker, so it doesn't leave any permanent lines. That is why we use it. Here we go, get the dirt out of there. Okay, rock and roll. Ready to finish that row. Well, I was tried. I thought I had three quarter inch base, but I bought the cheap stuff from the Home Depot. So these offcuts aren't gonna work for me. That one will. We'll keep that one. Anyway, I gotta cut something here. Let's do it this way. I'll use this for measuring purposes. At least I know where my joint is. So I'm just using this as a spacer. Whoops. I love the dry erase. And then we're gonna go like this. And we're gonna go like this. And we're gonna go like this. And we're gonna go like this. We're gonna narrow in that gap. All right, I have to cut two pieces, which actually is kind of nice. I only have one joint in the closet. It is perfect here. Okay. All right, here we go. I said earlier, that's no good. Save those two for another day. I'm gonna show you a trick that my son taught me, believe it or not, this guy. He's a genius. He invented a way to squeeze these joints and get maximized pressure. See, by using the side of the square, you're able to put pressure all on a longer period of wall. Boom. 
works every time. I thought that was genius, and I figured I might as well give him credit for it, because it's his bloody idea. There we go. Now that's nicely locked in, right? Grab yourself a square. Use it as a lever. Makes your flooring easy at the edges. Perfect every time. Now we can check this. Perfect gap coverage. Okay. Still want to take time. Make sure our joints are locked. That one didn't get locked. A little bit of lever action here. There we go. Wonderful. Finally, <laughs> we're ready to finish off with our closet. We got our floor installed. Let's move on because we're going to deal with our, our trims now. I'm just taking myself a little cheater piece of baseboard and my oscillating tool and I'm going to cut all of my trims. And that's it. It's that simple. All right. There we go. <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> it's so simple until it's not simple. I'm just going to work my way around the room. We're going to work our way out of the closet. I'm going to install my baseboard as I go, hang my cabinets, do my shelving, put my corner trim in. You're going to see this is a relatively quick process. The little gap that I'm cutting is actually going to get filled up with caulking anyway. Right? So, no one's ever going to see that line. Love a good versatile tool. So now that the trims are cut out, we can cut the baseboards to fill the whole space. I buy them in 16 foot lengths because I have a truck with a little cheater window, so I can slide it right through the front dash. That's a great gig, right? So I don't have to have small pieces on long walls. That's 104 and 5 eighths. I'm gonna cut that one first, then we'll hang the cabinet, finish off the cabinet installations. Finally gonna start looking like a closet. <laughs> Now we can get this cabinet installed. That's the benefit of the French cleat. You don't have to work with all that in your way. Whenever you're doing cabinetry, have your clamps handy. Lock these things in, and we're gonna add some screws to finish that off. Now we're not putting it in the holes. We're gonna go put an inch behind the hole and drive it flush. That gives us a much better finish. More useless packaging, eh? 8,000 miles of packaging. And three quarters. We were hanging this one and three quarters, and from the wall, 12 and a quarter. That's right. All right, now 12 and a quarter, one and three quarters to the top, 12 and three quarters, 12 and a quarter, sorry. One and three quarters. We're gonna pre drill our holes because melamine does not do well. The screws that don't have holes drilled for them. Now we might need to do a little explaining here because our original thought we were gonna have another cabinet here, maybe one at the other end. And then my wife got involved. <laughs> so then the plan changed. Now we're just going on one rod here. We're gonna save these shelves. This is great for storing your luggage. And you know, at the end of the day, she was right. She's a lot more practical. I was gonna overburden this space with too many things. <laughs> I installed it three quarters of an inch too low over here. Three quarters up from here to make that rod level. Next thing I gotta do is I gotta cut a bunch of shelves. I have to cut a shelf to go across here. And finish trimming this out and then hang the doors. Well, let's just scoot across to the hanging of the door section. That'll be a little more interesting. There's a few things we can learn here about um, structure and carrying this load and framing it out. Okay, guys, now remember this, this house was built 84. And it had the two mirror hanging doors here for since then. And it, this is all basically framed on one by threes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna beef it up and I'm gonna double them up. When I hang my door, I have something to throw some screws into. And this might almost be offensive, but the reality is I'm doubling up the structure <laughs> to carry the same load. I know, I know. I'm having a hard time with the two, but how many times in life do we overbuild, overcomplicate? All right. Whew. 
Let's go put on a header. 71. Sounds good to me. Here we are. We're going to mark our center of our sticks. Okay. And generally, I'm going to try to mark the, the middle of the new wood. I'm going to install this with some brad nails right out of the gate. And then I'm going to go throw a couple construction screws in after the fact, right? This is just to carry the weight. 82 and three quarters, only different. That one's just a hair taller. No big surprise, eh? Okay, so here I'm just going to share this with you. you. Ever have one of those days that don't go as planned? Um, this is a pre-cut casing. It's a door pack from Home Depot for casing doors. This door is too tall for this casing. It needs to be an extra inch and a quarter longer. <laughs> so I got to go back to the store and buy some more casing. Um, the plan was these are all pre-painted so that I could just install them and then I wouldn't have to use a brush down near the bottom and avoid touching the floor. I thought it was so smart and then I never bothered to measure and that's what happens. So back to the old proverbial drawing board on that one. We'll hit that one tomorrow. Uh, but for today, I wanted to show you one secret because down here, uh, the floor was cut a little bit too wide. I'm not an idiot. I know how to cut a floor. So I did this on purpose. I want to show you a really great trick to close this up. So let me cut my length of my baseboard. I'm going to show you what to do when you make this mistake. Because as a homeowner, most likely you will make a mistake something like this. All right, 47 and a half. Let me cut the trim. So here's my issue. When you cut your baseboard, too perfect. You nail it on, you get a gap showing up. Okay? That can be because you went and you bought the economy trim from Home Depot to save money. And that's not three quarters, it's five eighths. All right? So when you go to stick it in, you're like, okay, that's gonna be great. But then you put a nail in it and it shows this ugly gap. Well, the way we deal with that is this. <laughs> Grab yourself a screw gun, okay? And bury a drywall screw in the wall, the same depth as what your gap is showing. And nail it that way. Nail it across the top. Couple of different angles. Come on, baby. And there you go. You're gonna get a nice straight clean line. We do the caulking across the top, fill a few nails holes, and you too can hide a plethora of mistakes just by beefing up the back side of that trim, giving it something rigid. Right? It hits that nail, it's not going anywhere. Alright, well I'm back from Home Depot. I had to go buy some longer trim. Bought myself a 17 foot piece of trim and cut it in half. So that makes this possible. All right. Now, when you're doing this, the easiest way is to line up, give yourself what looks like a quarter inch, okay, gap. And then you consider, well, then I'm gonna have a quarter inch gap up here, right? So you take your pencil, you set it where it's gonna be, and you mark straight out. And then you end up with something like this. And where the pencil starts, that's your mark. That's where you wanna start. Your cut and you want to do it on a 45. Okay, so that's how we mark it. We do the left and the right side and then we'll cut these two and install them. I'm going to show you how to use the saw my way which is you measure once and then you cut twice. So we'll start with this one here. The way this works for best results is to have the mark right in front of your face. All right, so that way you can see what is going on. Okay, now I'm working on a bench. I do not have a miter saw station set up. So that it is a little trickier working on a portable scenario like this. Okay, so now I got my material set up. Here's my trick. I line up relatively close and I take my tape measure way down here. Okay, and that holds my material flat. It's only an eighth of an inch taller than the table, so it, it saves me a lot of hassle. Now here's what we're gonna do. Instead of holding the offcut, I'm gonna hold this piece, okay? 
with my thumb against this so I can't get in the way. What we're looking at here is I've got my pencil mark right on my trim and I want to cut and leave that pencil mark still visible. So I want to cut on the, this side of that trim. So what I do is I'm using my line of sight down this blade to anticipate where it's going to cut. All right. So that way when I do cut, I can hold the guard out of the way. I make a little bit of a mark, okay? And then I can adjust my trim by sliding it with my finger to the perfect spot. Now when I look, I can still see my pencil mark, okay? Which is a perfect cut. Like I said, I measured once and then I cut twice. That's how you zero in on that to make it perfect. And in like manner going the other direction, change that degree, bring my, remove the guard, bring it down, eyeball it. That looks really tight. Then I start the motor, a little check. Confirm my cut. I still see my pencil mark. There we go. Nice. So I know that there's framing right here. Okay. So instead of trying to use nail into this trim right away, I'm just going to go for my positioning. Okay. In this trim right here, throw a couple of nails in. That gives me wiggle room when I'm installing the rest of my trim later. Okay. Same on the other side. I'll get it, my mark established. Knowing that this comes warped, in a lot of cases it's not straight, so you're going to have to straighten it out as you go. But right now what I'm doing is I'm establishing the header. So here's how we measure that one. We measure from the outside to the outside. This one is 74 and a half. So now I cut the header 74 and a half, put the angle cuts on both ends, and I can set it in place. And even if I'm a little shy or a little, little long, I can manipulate the trim to make sure I get a perfectly square corner. Now I've got that detail in place. I'm switching over to the shorter one and a quarter inch nails. And I'm going to shoot this detail into the jam. Make sure that we get this straightened out. Right here, it needs to be pulled back a bit. And then I switch back to the two inch just to pull the trim nice and tight to the wall. Okay. The whole point when you're doing your trim work is to eliminate gaps. Get rid of all the shadows that you can, okay? And then it'll reduce the amount of caulking that you gotta do and make your life a lot easier. <laughs> all right. Let me just, uh, Take a look at this now. Okay, today I am using the DAP crown molding trim caulking. Um, it's a, uh, they claim to be crack proof. That's nice. I got, I got, cause I got a couple issues here. I'm gonna install the header for my doors and install my doors now and paint after. But I do have this detail here that needed a little bit of a fill. And I wanna do this before I Start putting other materials in the way. There we go. We are going to set this edge a quarter inch back from the face. There we go. I like that location. Alrighty. Let me just get my first screw in place here. These screws are horrible. <laughs> okay. Woof. For the record, these construction screws you guys got down here in the US. They sell in the Home Depot. They got a horrible initial bite. Does everybody else have the same issue or is it just me? Oh my goodness. 
totally out of whack. Whenever I see a hole in the track that's gonna be carrying weight, I like to throw a screw in it. And anticipating I was gonna need five or six, the jam piece as well, I put a screw in every single piece of new wood that we had up there. So we are gonna be talking the capacity to carry 80 times six, that's almost 500 pounds. Now these doors, although their mirrors are heavy, they're not 500 pounds. So as long as we can have a nice healthy transition so the gap from the carrying screws are short, then this extrusion, this metal molding, will be able to carry all kinds of weight for us. Now generally speaking with these wheels, if you leave a little bit more height from the bottom to the top of the, the door, it's easier for installation purposes. And what I do is I sit back here like this, and I walk up, and I put it on, and then slowly to the ground and make sure that it's hanging and not scraping the ground. Wow, that is just clearing. Okay, that is really close for comfort. So before I go any further, we're gonna shorten up the gap. The drill just driving forward and it lifts the door. I have the same problem, so this is good. All right, now, nothing in this world is level and square, but you do wanna have your door have a position that's gonna be permanent. So over here, I wanna make sure that this door it's flush with the jam and a couple of little twists and there we go that's about as good as we're gonna get okay not bad for a couple of reclaimed doors eh? there we go get up get it up on that trim here oh. there. that's the harder of the two now I'm going to go lift those wheels as well and I'll slide the door. Oh, that's not in the track yet. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Whew. So I went to the store, picked up a couple of these little trim pieces here. Check this out. It's like a really uh, flat mullion that's really kind of small. It's only three quarter inch wide. And it kind of looks very similar to the stuff they were using on the trailer. Although it's got a little bit more meat, so it'll hold the brad nail better. And I'm just going to line it up and take a couple of quick guesstimate, restimate, estimates here. Not worry about being too perfect. And allow the caulking to fill the gap. There's a few more pieces of trim that have to be installed around here that need some paint attention. Obviously, once I put the base in, I've got to do an inside corner still. There is a staple right in the way. Good. Now I'm going to do baseboards two different ways. First way is I'm going to measure and then cut the piece. The second way is I'm going to do the cut and then I'm going to put it in position and then mark it. So there's two different ways you can do this. It all depends on, you know, what you think is more efficient for your own personality. To the wall, to my trim is exactly 31 and a half. And I want it square here and cut there. So what I would do is I would just mark it 31 and a half. Okay. And I go inside corner, and square side. So I'm visualizing my trim. Throw my inside corner on it. And I'll mark my 31 and a half from the, this bottom corner over here. 31 and a half. Now remember, we're in a trailer here, so the wiring runs along the outside wall. So there is no wires coming from down underneath. So you're perfectly okay to nail this on. And honestly, you want to. You want to have a two inch nail, the bottom profile, and a 45 degree angle so that you can pick up the wall plate because tacking this to the wood panel it doesn't do you any good and in most cases just because there's a wall plug here it doesn't mean there's framing there because they're mounting it to the wall if you're not happy with your gap you can throw a nail in it but what i like to do if i'm not happy with the gap is i'll nail in two different directions so i'm on an angle this way and then i'm on an angle the other way so i've got nails going like this to hold me nice and tight that way, when I put my caulking on and I paint all that in, I know over time it's not going to end up moving and splitting on me. If you're not in a trailer and you're watching this video, please remember most houses have the wiring for these plugs coming from underneath. So don't go throwing nails in that three inches around there. Or you might nick your wire. And then you're starting all over again running new wire. Yeah, 
Learn that one the hard way. The next way to do this is how I usually do this is I'll throw on my angle here first and I'll come back over and then I'm gonna eyeball it and mark it with the pencil. Let's get our trim cut. I can jam that in there nice and tight. Get this down here. Now I can make a pencil mark where I want my blade to go. And the, what I'm doing is I'm going half and half. I'm, I want the blade to cut just a little bit more than off this edge. Mark the surface. You want to cut this flat because the, the saw just isn't really cutting perfectly. You know, you get what you pay for, and I got a great deal on this saw, but it's causing me a fair amount of headache trying to get a decent cut. So we'll start here. I'm going to just make sure my base trim is pushed down. Remember when floating floors, these things can really they can sit a little high and proud on you. So make sure you put everything back in position. Now to finish off this project, obviously I'm going to need a little caulking. My trim is going to be semi-gloss white. As much as or as little as needed here. Those little nail holes. We're doing something a little silly today. We're actually, we're casing this out with a regular size door jam so that we can get the illusion of a regular house. Remember this used to have a quarter inch piece of paneling and that's the caulking line right here. <laughs> now my new piece of material is three quarters, which is almost the same size as this frame. So there won't be a whole lot of frame left showing when I'm done. And personally, I don't care as long as the window will open and it will. So what we're looking at here is the existing frame is somewhere between two and five eighths. Yeah, two and three quarters. Well, almost three, two and three quarters. It's all over the place. There's no rhyme or reason. Uh, it's because these windows are installed over that corrugated metal on the outside. If you didn't see the video, we swapped out a bunch of windows in the house already. What we're going to focus on today is instead of trying to make a perfect window casement that comes up in contact with this window, I'm just going to go with stock lumber. It comes two and a half inches wide. I'm going to have a bit of a gap and personally, I don't care. It's so much easier for me to fill that gap with a caulking after the fact than to try to make everything perfect. This is a bedroom after all, right? It's on a south facing window. In the living room, we had five windows in the bay window area. Up there, we took the time to custom cut every one of those jams and try to make it as perfect as possible. That video is gonna be coming soon. So, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you wanna see that kind of carpentry. But for here, I'm gonna keep my life simple. We're in get it done mode, all right? So I'm gonna just cut a piece, cut a piece, cut a piece. I'm gonna trim this out clockwise. The first one is 30 and a half. I'm gonna do myself a favor and take a hair off of that. I'm gonna cut it, drop it, measure, cut and drop, and just trim that out. And then we'll come back and put the window casing on. Now, what we see on this window is just a drywall compound from when we did the texture spray. When I'm all said and done here, before I do my caulking, I'm gonna come along with a wet rag and I'll clean this up. But for now, we're looking to go flush with this surface. That is the goal here. And then we get this measurement. 52 and three quarters. Now one of the reasons I love this gun is it doesn't work when there's no nails. This one actually, it stops when there's about four nails left, okay? Gives you a chance to reload so you don't have a bunch of nail holes that didn't do anything. <laughs> that is awesome. 29 and 5 eighths. Okay, the last one, we'll push it up here and I'll run the tape past the wood. Get down here and read it in person. 51 and 7 eighths shy, which means just a little bit less than the actual measurement. 51, 7 eighths, and then I'll mark the wood a little bit shy, and that's where I'll put my blade. Yep, shy, all right. Maybe even a little too shy. 
If you cut short, just split the difference. There's no sense throwing that piece of wood in the garbage. You're going to be putting caulking up there anyway because any wood joint like this around a window is going to expand and contract a little bit. So as long as we're caulking, let's be smart about how we use our wood. So remember when we're trimming out a window, we want to have that, that nice little 1 8 profile, right? Away from the edge. So if you want, you can even draw it in if it makes it, makes it easier for you to, to measure. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure from here. Right? Put the tip of that right into that wood. To here. What I end up with is 29 and 3 8 Okay? So take that measurement, write it down before we forget. Now, we also have to cut this wood so that we miter the outside corner. So when you think about it, this intersection here is going to be two pieces of wood that goes down here like this. The outside point is equal to the width of this trim on each side. So it's two and a quarter, so we have to add four and a half. So plus four and a half, and let's translate that, is going to mean um, four eighths, okay? So now I got four, there's 33, and four eighths is seven eighths. 33 and seven eighths. I'll take that cut, I'll miter the joints, and I'll come back to install it. From the pencil mark to pencil mark is 29 and three eighths. Two pieces of this trim at two and a quarter makes four and a half. Translate that to the same denominator, so it's four eighths. So then I can add that all together to get 33 and seven eighths. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little bit of my pencil mark still showing. What I'm looking for here is to line my blade up. They come right off this tip here. Okay. So I'll cut. Get a look at how much I have to move it over. Slide my wood over and try to cut again. Now I'm close, but not quite. So I've got my hand here. I'll just take my thumb and give it a little bit of a nudge. That's it. Using the guard, the, the fence guide here with your hand, your thumb can move that back and forth a full quarter. So that's how I set it up. So then I can take a cut, a little nudge, pull it back and forth. Perfect every time. Same thing here. We're looking to come right off this corner. This one's a little easier to line up. Now, that's not in the corner. That actually has a sixteenth of a return. So I know I have to slide it over. So same thing, I just get a little bit of a nudge here. Okay. Now we're using the same philosophy here. I've still got the two inch nails in my gun. So I'm not shooting anywhere near the jam because I don't want to have that rebound back in. So I'm setting this on my pencil line for my depth. And I'm moving my intersection right there where that pencil mark is. Check my other side. I have just a hair extra, so I'll split the difference. I like that, that's consistent. Okay, and I know there's wood here. And I know there's wood here. Remember, when they're framing a wall, there's always a piece of wood framed right next to the jam. Okay, so that's a great place to put the first two. Now, it's established, I can measure from here to this point, okay, on both sides, and they should be the same, give or take. <laughs> so I'll just set it on there, and I get to 52 and a quarter, okay? Now remember, when you're measuring something from the outside, the tape end moves. That's an accurate measurement. When you're measuring from the inside, this slides, and it makes that adjustment for the thickness of itself. So you can measure into something or off of something and you get an exact measurement. If your end of your tape isn't moving the same thickness as the metal here, it's time to get a new tape. 52, I'm gonna go a little bit more than a quarter. 52, 52 and 3 eighths. So, 
All of our focus is down here when we're doing this. We want to line up our outside corner to be absolutely perfect. One of the easiest ways to do that, just like that. Don't even look at what's going on up top. As long as that nail isn't sunk in here nice and close to the bottom, we're going to take a look at this now. One nail through the side. Those are nice and flush. Now, wood bends. Now, because everything here is warped, the jam, the building, maybe the trim, you can nail as you want to go, leaving that consistent gap. Okay, we're going to not nail the very top because, as you can see, this trim can be manipulated still on both sides. Now we're going to take an outside corner to outside corner measurement, which is 33 and 5 eighths. Because I know this is fighting me, I added just a hair so I can pull this one out of the way to set it in properly. Now I'm liking the size of this. I'm going to have to pull this trim to set it down. That's fine. The first thing I'm going to do is come over here and try to establish this outside corner to be flush. Inch and a quarter nail works every time. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with this. Okay. Now I gotta work on this. Now I'm gonna just pull this down. Close this gap up a little bit. Now there's no need for me to run around putting a bunch of nails on the outside unless I got a huge gap. I do have a bit of a gap here. We're gonna see if we can close that up with a couple of nails. I just don't know if there's anything there for this to bite, bite into. Okay. That seemed to have a nice effect. All right, good. Now the only thing left on any window trim is to make sure that the trim is nailed every eight to 10 inches into the jam because we're gonna add caulking in these joints and we don't want it separating. So having that all pinned up makes the world a difference. In this scenario, what we're not concerned about is, is there a gap up here or there or underneath? No one's ever gonna see that, okay? So don't add extra nails just for the sake of doing it because you're adding extra holes that need to be filled, <laughs> right? An extra potential for a nail to pop out or the head to be raised and look like garbage when you paint. You can still operate the window and from across the room, it'll look pretty. I'm not even gonna bother caulking this up. To be honest with you, I think caulking will take away from it and make it look ugly. It's better for me to just leave the gaps. It's a commercial brown window. Maybe someday down the road, I'll come over here and I'll change that window out, okay? And then we'll have to redo the jam and everything anyway. But down here in Florida, really the most important goal with a window is it keeps the water out and keeps out the birds. We don't worry too much about the thermal dynamic of it. Now we're gonna cock this sucker, all right? Before we paint, let it set, set up. We're just gonna fill that gap here so that it's concave. And this is preparing for paint now. So if you see gaps like this, it's not done. It's not ready. Leave a little bit more material on the surface. Okay, and then lightly fill that up. We're gonna throw a bead on the surface. Okay, and then lightly, don't, don't overpress it so that it stays there. Take the extra material, rub it into a nail hole. Remember, you're always better to pull the caulking gun than push it. All right, now there's excess, right? So I'm gonna use it to fill a nail hole. And this is great, okay? Well, then when I run out, what do I do? Well, here's how the caulking gun works as all. Well. You punch this and you can feel the resistance. Now there's pressure. Not enough pressure to bring any material up. So when I'm holding the gun, I can just go like this. A little squeeze a little dollop, okay? That's how I can control this for going around filling all my joints. A little squeeze, a little dollop. I can do this about 10 times before I have to reset the pressure on the gun. If you take the pressure off the gun and you bring it back to where it's just pressurized, you have control over how much caulking is coming out of that gun and when and where you want it. A lot of guys have a hard time using a caulking gun effectively because they're always removing the pressure and bringing the pressure back and then they get too much material on their finger to fill a nail hole. This little squeeze with the left hand and then pick it up with the right hand. 
that works really, really well. I mean, all we're doing is filling a nail hole. So if you put a dollop on your finger that's the same size as that nail hole, you aren't going to have a bunch of caulking left all over your casing that you have to clean off before you can paint. I'm just going to rub in a little bit of material in there for that. Beautiful. Ready for painting.